Ladies and gentlemen, today is December the 19th, 2021, and we are just about to begin world discussion with Agent Smith. This is a conversation between two non-experts. He is more of an expert than I am. If you have any feedback for things as we're talking along, feel free to share. If you have any questions, feel free to share. Moss is handling questions. Thank you, Moss Neotech. And if you have uh, questions in the YouTube comments, fire away. Without further ado, I will jump in the channel. Agent Smith! Hello? Hello? Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Well, I'm doing all right. Can't complain. So the, your week been? It's been a good week. It's been a busy week. I think not just for me, but for the heckin' world. Sometimes you ask, was there anything that caught your eye? I've already got like six things. And some weeks I show up with a no. <laughs> so that's pretty fun. Yeah. Are you chilling with family for Christmas? I'm always chilling with family. <laughs> nice. That's a yes. Do you have any signature family meals, any traditional meal? Well, we do have a dinner, but... But there's no fixed item that's like a key item? Yeah. Hmm. We have that's waffles bad. with strawberries and cream for breakfast on Christmas. <laughs> well, that sounds colorful. It's really good. Sometimes it's better than the presents. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the presents. Socks is a pretty low bar. Yeah, usually we get more than socks. Depends on how well behaved you are, I guess. Were you good this year, chat? How good were you this year, chat, on a scale from 1 to 10? Everyone below a 6 gets socks for Christmas. But if you're below a 2, you don't get socks, you get coal. People are rating themselves pretty highly. Sounds like there may be some bias at work. Of course they <laughs> There are people who might roll low on purpose so they can get socks if they need socks. Self-reported data is generally the least reliable. Yeah. Or at least among the least reliable. Someone's going to be playing Santa this month. That's an instant plus one. Well, so yeah, nice. this week there was some some big stuff that happened. Uh, we've been talking about Chile for a while now, their uh, constitution they're working on, and they just had an election and the winner was decided. And the title where I read this initially said, leftist millennial wins. And they were like, <laughs> does this person have a name too? Yes, it's leftist millennial, the third. <laughs> But I guess the person this individual is up against was a fascist, or they were basically saying Pinochet, I think is the name of the guy, would have voted for him if they were still alive. So a lot of people, I think, couldn't in good conscience vote for him based on that. Maybe that guy thought that that was a good thing to like use as an edge. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of conservatism in Chile, so it's not as though he doesn't have some supporters. And there's been a lot of upset in the public about all of the protesting that's been going on and some of the rise in crime. So there was definitely a market for those ideas. Hmm. And, uh, you know, he's not like a full on fascist. He's just right wing. Um, he's definitely more on the right wing of the right wing part of the spectrum, but he I don't know that he was he's so far right as to qualify as being far right. You know, it's not unusual in Latin America to hear conservatives advocate for uh, previous authoritarian governments. You know, in Brazil, they've got Jair Bolsonaro, who talks sometimes about uh, how he appreciates the military rule, uh, the period of Brazilian history where the military governed the country. And, uh, you know, there's similar sentiments are not uncommon on the right wing of the uh, latin america's political spectrum so it's not necessarily unusual per se it would be more unusual if you said that they should go back to an authoritarian system you know that that would probably be much more of a uh, break with 
uh, you know, the, the average. <clears throat> Chat's asking a little bit about the relative political leaning versus uh, for South America versus the world. So if, if this guy is called a leftist and he won, people in chat are saying that South America is pretty far right. Is South America more right than the U.S.? Oh, man. Um, so I'm going to give a really unsatisfying answer. <laughs> and the answer is that it depends. So it depends on how you want to uh, label right or left wing. Because, uh, you know, how you how you kind of label them uh, depends on what kinds of issues that you want to use as your metric. So if you want to look at something like uh, social policy, something like uh, the role of religion in public life, for example, uh, in that sense, Latin America is, you know, on average, much more conservative than the United States. Um, in terms of economic issues, it tends to be more to the left, relatively speaking. You know, you can definitely find people in Latin American politics who are dead set against the state having a role in the economy. And there's no shortage of economic elites, oligarchs, what have you, who are dead set against uh, any kind of redistributive politics. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Central America in particular, there's a history of the US intervening in politics to ensure redistributive politics uh, are suppressed. Uh, but at the same time, there's definitely uh, demand, so to speak, on the left side of the political spectrum in Latin America uh, to have more redistribution. And they've sometimes been more successful than the left in the United States in getting that, depending on the era. So maybe you could say then that Latin America is more conservative socially, but is actually somewhat more economically to the left. Than the United States. Yeah, broad question, obviously, because there are lots of countries in South America, and they're not all going to be precisely equal. But the usual consensus is that Europe is, on average, more left-leaning than the U.S. Probably for both categories that you listed. But you're saying for <laughs> South America, maybe more socially conservative, more economically liberal. Yeah, well, I, there's a lot of variance in Europe, too. I mean, Eastern Europe is definitely more socially conservative than Western Europe. Yeah, especially you know, when, for role of, like, religion and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, in general, you could say that Eastern Europe is probably relatively more socially liberal than the United States, but it's definitely uh, more conservative than Western Europe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Poland has had a lot of drama with uh, abortion politics in the past year or two. So that's kind of come to the fore there. Yeah, they also like to crack down on metal bands for doing stuff that pisses off the church. <laughs> now, which particular example were you thinking of? Uh, I think the vocalist of Behemoth got into some trouble for doing something that was uh, blaspheming. I think they're one of the countries that still like does criminal punishment for blasphemy hmm. i don't know if the u.s does that anymore is that a french group polish group polish group okay. yeah poland has a really... very strong uh black metal scene and i think other metal genres as well huh well, i didn't know that well, i had read a story recently about uh a group like that that was trying to do a concert inside of a church but there was a bunch of protesters that showed up and so mm. they ended up moving to a different church secretly they actually officially canceled the uh concert i guess and uh they secretly emailed everybody who had a ticket and told them to that they would they were actually just going to relocate it to a different church a little bit away hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, the church they were originally going to do it in was a relatively well-known large Catholic church, and so some of the local Catholics didn't appreciate that. Uh, so they moved over to a Protestant church, and that was apparently okay. <laughs> so that was the election thing. Gretz Chile on your election. And then another one that 
stood out was there was a Washington state senator who recently passed away. And that's a bummer, but um, he was also, I think, involved in some shady stuff in the Americas, like in South and Central America. Did you hear anything about this? Can't say that I did. He's a state senator? Washington state senator, yes. So he's not like of the federal government, one of the senators mm-hmm. from Washington. It's the Washington state legislature he's a senator for. Doug Erickson? Yes. Uh, no, I hadn't heard anything about it. I definitely hadn't heard about anything involving Latin America. Yeah. Hmm. Like a Cold War thing he was involved in? Uh, I'm not sure. I know that he was an anti vax or anti massacre, but I don't know about. Uh, what exactly he was up to there. Oh, he was the former leader of Donald Trump's presidential campaign. Oh. Apparently. Yeah, I could see how he might have, in so much as he was an insider in the Trump campaign, if not also the administration, then I could see how he might have been used as a contact. But it doesn't sound... I don't know. Erickson is not a particularly Latin sounding name, so I'm not sure how many contacts he would have had down there. Maybe they were business contacts or something. Hmm. But yeah, I can't really elaborate on that because I had not heard of it. Doug Erickson. But wait, there's more. There was the Build Back Better thing, and there was someone who voted no on that, and people seem to be upset <laughs> because it was maybe a swing vote. Uh, have you, do you remember Senator Manchin? That seems to be the name in question for this. It is. Yeah. Uh, he's the senator. He's a senator from West Virginia. And, uh, you know, because the Senate is almost split down, dead down the middle, I mean, it's literally 49 senators. Uh, no, it's... No, wait. Oops. 49 senators apiece, is that what it was? Oh, but my brain isn't working. Basically, the Democrats need all of their senators to vote in order to pass anything. And that even that is just enough to get them to use the vice president as the tiebreaker. Mm-hmm. So what that means then is that moderate Democrats have a lot uh, of influence because basically they can just shut down anything. Um, I guess technically anybody, any given senator could be the one that defects and makes demands. Uh, but most of them are generally pretty okay with any degree of you know, progressive legislation, but the moderates tend to be more conservative. So they tend to be the uh, outliers here in the past year, uh, the dissenters, if you like. And uh, there's two in particular that have been very prominent in demanding concessions in exchange for their support on democratic legislation. And uh, Joe Manchin from West Virginia has been one, and then Kristen Sinema from Arizona. So both of them have been the principal blocks to passing the Build Back Better plan. Mm. And there had been extensive talks, you know, over the course of this month uh, to try to get the legislation passed before the end of the year. And there was a number of concessions made, you know, on this, that, or the other particular component of the bill. Uh, But ultimately, it seems that uh, that effort has been unsuccessful, which surprised me. You know, I mentioned last week that this was a, this would be a big feather in the cap for the Democratic Party. And so it was very much in their interest to get it passed. And uh, I'm pretty surprised that they were not able to make it work, even if it involved significant concessions on the part of more progressive members of the Senate. So with the, you know, the announcement today that Joe Manchin made was, uh, you know, on a Fox News segment of all things, uh, he announced that he was not going to support the bill, basically. You know, it's it's a no, he said. And uh, there's just not enough time, basically, for further negotiations. They either had to do it, like, soon or never, basically, at least not this year. They'll have, 
presumably they'll start negotiations again uh, next year once uh, Congress is back in session. But for now, it's uh, kind of a dead letter. It ain't going to happen. Why would he not support it? I haven't read all the details oh, of the bill. So it's think... a really big bill. Yeah, cost was uh, probably the biggest single issue he had with it. He didn't want to pass something that would add significantly to the deficit and the national debt. Uh, those were kind of two items that he harped on in particular. Although it's not that bad in the grand scheme of things. I think it comes out to like 50 to $70 billion a year, something like that. Mm. So not, it's not the most destructive, you know, fiscally destructive bill you could pass. Uh, but, you know, given how much debt the United States has rung up over the past two years, uh, he's particularly sensitive to further, you know, additions to the national debt. So he's been trying to kind of whittle out different parts of the bill to make it smaller. Uh, I think one of the things that he specifically was homing in on was the child tax credit. I don't know if we ever talked about it, but there was a uh, an addition made, basically. They increased the child tax credit so that uh, relatively more people could qualify and the amount paid out was significantly more. And I think it's a monthly payment now as well. So that's a, an interesting experiment, you know, policy-wise. That was a, an effort to significantly reduce child poverty. And uh, from what I was reading before it was passed, uh, it should have reduced child poverty in the United States by something like half. I haven't seen follow-up research on it, but I would presume that it's significantly cut into the number of children who just don't have enough resources for things like school or supplies or what have you. So that policy was implemented, but it also had a sunset clause to it. It's only going to last for, I think, another year or a couple years, something like that. Uh, but one of the things the Build, Build Back Better plan was going to do was to significantly increase uh, the amount of time that the new policy would stay implemented. So instead of just being a few years, uh, they would extend it for something like five to ten years. So Manchin was opposed to that and wanted that removed because uh, he thought it would add too much uh, cost to the bill, basically. There's probably some other specific items that he picked out, but I don't have them in my notes here. But basically, that's the gist of it. It kind of just comes down to cost more than anything. Mm -hmm. So people are very upset at him because they really wanted to pass it. And so they, you know, people, you know, the White House uh, left, you know, Democratic senators, Democratic House members have all been kind of bitching him out on social media. Well, it seems like he's making a bit of a show of it if he's announcing it on Fox News as opposed to, like, in a congressional hearing. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But he's a politician, so... Yeah. That's... <laughs> that's... One of the tricky things that you have to deal with as a politician is not just doing things to represent your constituents, but making sure that your constituents know that you're doing things for them. You know, it's easy to be invisible, in Washington, especially if you don't have like a prominent seat at a uh, high ranking committee of some kind. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a fair amount of the public actions and public displays uh, that this, that or the other congressman engages in are strategic in nature. They do that purposely to get their name in the news or to get their name in headlines or what have you so that their constituents know that he's doing something. Mm -hmm. So Manchin has been a bit theatrical over the course of the past year in opposing uh, the Build Back Better plan, but his constituents are relatively moderate, all told. And so uh, he's been trying to make sure that they know that he is using his influence in order to ensure that their preferences are represented in the policymaking process and to ensure that he gets credit for that. Mm. So it's on ice for now. We'll see what happens early next year, because I'm sure they'll pick up on it again then. So build Mac better. We'll have to build the bill back better. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <clears throat>
Yeah, they got the infrastructure bill passed, but uh, Build Back Better is going to have to wait. What else jumped out at me this week? Just a fun headline. Over 50% of Americans don't want either Trump or Biden next cycle, which is pretty fun. Yeah, you know, in American politics, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the establishment and the status quo. So there's a very strong streak of anti-establishmentarianism right now. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have much of a vector through which to express itself. So it's kind of unresolved and doesn't seem likely that uh, it's going to be resolved anytime soon. So there's a lot of demand for substantive change, but not a lot of understanding of how specifically it should be done. Mm -hmm. And until that bridge is gapped, there's probably not going to be much progress and the public is still is going to remain, you know, consternated. Was there anything else that kind of caught your eye? Mm, I think there was something else. I'll let you know when it comes back to me. Gotcha. Let's see. <laughs> well, we had a couple questions. We can take a crack at those. Heck yeah. Let's see. What happens when a government doesn't get its next year budget bill approved? What are the consequences? Thanks. I'm guessing this is specifically referencing the United States, I would assume. Because really the answer to this question is going to differ pretty significantly from country to country. Uh, in the case of the United States, uh, we basically just have a shutdown, which I think we're pretty well known for at this point. Um, there are little things that can be done to kind of delay uh, shutdowns in the United States in the absence of a bill. And, uh, you know, that's actually been some of what the government's been doing, you know, since there hasn't uh, been agreement or hadn't been, at least until recently. So, you know, the Federal Reserve will kind of shuffle money around a little bit in order to make sure the government uh, has access to liquidity. Uh, they'll borrow short, short term. Uh, in so much as they can. And uh, different programs have different parts of their budget they can tap, you know. Uh, basically, they can use things that they're not normally supposed to use for. You know, they'll, might, they'll have some item in their budget that's supposed to be used for one thing. So they can take that and use it as a temporary source of funding in order to just stay in operation. So there are just little things that the government does on the side in the absence of a uh, agreement on a bill in order to continue basic operations. And uh, sometimes what the government will do is agree on like a short-term funding bill. That's that's become very common in Washington over the past few years. Uh, that just kind of keeps things going for a couple months until like an actual bill can be can be agreed to. But uh, yeah, that's roughly what happens, you know, basically. Uh, they just kind of fiddle with the numbers a little bit to try to stay in operation. Eventually, they just kind of run out of money and they can't do that anymore. And then they actually have to start shutting down things like national parks or you know administrative agencies, offices, what have you. And uh, I guess those would qualify as the consequences as asked in the question. Uh, generally, critical services like the military, national security, those will not be shut down. You know, those kind of keep operating regardless. Uh, although I think some intelligence agencies maybe will suffer some disruption. I don't quite remember. I remember reading something during the last shutdown about CIA officers having trouble doing their job. I don't quite remember the details, though. <clears throat> But yeah, everybody else will have like their hours cut or maybe they just won't be able to come in at all or, you know, what have you.
Overall, though, in the United States, uh, a lot of government activity is done at the local and state level. So you don't necessarily notice a federal shutdown too much, depending on your circumstances. Like if you're a student trying to apply for a student loan or to get into college, it can be really inconvenient because the Department of Education frequently gets shut down. Uh, you know, inspectors working for the Department of Energy or the FDA or what have you. Uh, sometimes they can't do their job as well, or maybe not at all. So obviously that has knock-on effects on uh, the, you know, the safety of the supply chain. But yeah, I, mean, I think it's overall pretty intuitive. But at the state and local level, things kind of continue operating. So, you know, you don't have to worry about the stoplights not working or, uh, you know, state level programs will continue to function. Yeah, it's not it's not as intrusive as you might think to have the federal government not operating. Still not a good idea, but it does it does happen now and again, unfortunately. Now, in other governments, they basically have to have a budget done. Uh, so I don't know that it's even necessarily possible in a lot of other systems of government because they'll just have legislation that kind of hardwires in uh, the negotiation of a bill. Why do we not have to have ours? Because uh, it's, ne it's negotiated in the Senate. You know, the Senate is solely responsible for negotiating uh, tax revenue. Mm. And so, uh, as a result, it pretty much just begins and ends with them. Although the House does have to pass it, too. Uh, but the Senate just doesn't have any rules in place that really require them, per se, to have it done by a certain deadline. You know, it's just purely... They do it in a deliberative style, so to speak. Yeah, there's probably been proposals to change that, but I'm not familiar with them. Well, we are the country with the filibuster, so yeah, it's not entirely out of character. Yeah, it would probably be better if uh, we did have some kind of deadline in place, but then there would be complaints about. Uh, diminishing the freedom of action of Congress and in, you know, impinging on their uh, authority, which they don't like. <clears throat> and I'm sure this, that, or the other, you know, one or the other rather party would oppose it for uh, giving them some kind of disadvantage. Given how partisan things are in Washington, that would surprise me either. Uh, let's see. Next question was, my question was going to be more along the lines of whether or not we will see real reform with Chile's new leadership. For example, sectors of their economy, such as energy and education, becoming completely state-owned. Huh. Probably not. I don't think they have the votes for that, do they? I think conservatives gained seats in the last election, so I don't think the legislature is... Uh, sufficiently left-leaning to allow for big reforms like that. And the president can't do it by himself. I'm curious. Well, I guess I would have to read more specifically about uh, how legislation is passed in Chile, because I'm not sure how big of a majority they would need to do something really dramatic like that. Chile Vamos. Center right. Yeah, just kind of looking at a cursory graph of the distribution of seeds, it seems like the right has relatively more. But I'm also not super familiar with the individual parties, so I would defer to chat on that. I guess this would be a good time for the usual disclaimer. I'm not an expert in, in everything I talk about on here, uh, painfully obvious at times. 
Uh, so if I ever say anything stupid, wrong, or biased, please do correct me. If I'm wrong, I want to know more than anybody. So participation in chat is encouraged in that regard. Yeah, as to whether or not significant reforms are likely in Chile, I don't know. I'm skeptical they have enough seats to make it happen, but we'll see. And the Constitutional Convention is still ongoing, so, you know, they could kind of write it into the Constitution that they could do something like that. So it kind of depends on what the outcome is there. I haven't been following the Constitutional Convention super closely, so I'm not sure where the negotiations are at right now. I do know that the Constitutional Convention is relatively left-leaning, so it's relatively likely there's going to be a relatively left-leaning constitution uh, once they finish anyway. But I don't know if they'll just go full nationalization of the energy and education sectors. It'd be interesting if they did. <laughs> Not a little bit of drama happened the last time they tried. And we'll see how their luck holds out this time. What happened last time? Oh, that was Pinochet. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Didn't go too well. That was uh, President Allende was, uh, I don't know if he was an outright socialist or not, per se, but he was definitely trying to uh, spearhead a push to nationalize uh, certain industries and to significantly ins expand the scope of government. <clears throat> and uh, more than a few people on the right were upset about it. Uh, the CIA kind of went out of their way to try to exacerbate things by uh, publishing inflammatory editorials and newspapers and, you know, trying to pay people to go protest and that kind of thing. But there was a fair amount of legitimate opposition, too. I mean, conditions were not doing... When conditions in the late 60s weren't that great. And I remember there being some issues with some of the implementation of some of the reforms that they were doing, running into problems as well. So the end result of that is basically uh, Augusto Pinochet, who I believe was a general in the army. Something in the back of my head says maybe he was Air Force, but I think he was army. But uh, he seized power in the early 70s, basically. Uh, taking advantage of all the discord around uh, Allende and those policies he was trying to implement. And then Augusto Pinochet was in power for 20 years after that. What, late 80s, I think? So when he finally nominally stepped down, he never actually fully stepped down. He actually created a permanent seat in uh, the Senate, I think it was. It was like a special seat just for him. Yeah, he ended up having to uh, hide out in Spain because his health wasn't doing well and because uh, some of the Chilean governments in the aughts started to kind of go after him for the, you know, all the human rights abuses and whatnot. <clears throat> oh, wait, maybe it was... He was in Spain for medical treatment. Maybe it was the Spanish who actually were going after him because I remember Spain was the gov had the government that declared that they were going to... Uh, enforce universality is that what it was basically they were going to convict people for human rights abuses regardless of whether or not uh, the abuses in question happened in spain and i think pinochet may have been one of the early people that they went after my memory is super fuzzy on that i think i do remember hearing about it in the news back in the day Yeah, interesting uh, trivia about Chile. They actually had a, a left-wing government in the 1930s. I don't remember what the dude's name was. I think it was President Alessandri. Is that what it was? Well, basically, it was a left-wing government, and I think it even had some communists in it. 
but their majority in Congress was like paper then. And so they ended up having to negotiate uh, a lot of concessions to the conservatives. But technically they were in power for a good bit there. So it sounds like they have pretty polarized politics down there then? Well, I mean, the Southern Cone in particular does uh, because they had so many immigrants come back in the early 20th century to work as laborers in the factories. Mm -hmm. Back when the region was kind of industrializing, uh, there was a need for workers. And so a lot of them came from Europe. And of course, you know, urban workers have uh, divergent interests from those of uh, rural areas. And uh, their interests also clashed pretty significantly with the traditional political elite in the Southern Cone region. So there was a lot of drama in the 20th century, partly just because of that. You know, lots of workers who wanted more active, strong governments providing uh, stronger welfare states, clashing with the uh, traditional, you know, cadillos of one sort or another, you know, the landed elite combined with nationalist militaries, generally often related by family in a lot of cases, would uh, oppose them. Although there were some na nationalists who wanted to uh, have a stronger welfare state as they saw that as just inherently you know good and necessary in order to uh, elevate uh, the stature of the country and to make it more well to make it stronger basically so i think uh, juan perón was known for doing that perón was very much a he was a nationalist but he wanted a stronger state as well you know that's kind of how he bought you know he, he bought his support basically amongst his constituents <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, partisanship in the Andes region as well, but that's more just classical, classical rural poverty uh, versus landed elite style inequality mm -hmm. of the sort that's been very common in Latin America, kind of from the start of the Spanish conquests. Yeah, lots of uh, impoverished rural communities in places like Peru and Bolivia are still heavily like Native American. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the economic elites, in contrast, tend to be disproportionately white. They tend to be more located in like uh, the cities and whatnot. So that's a very clear divide, just right there. And that kind of forms the backbone of a lot of politics in the region. Colombia had some industrialization. So that did play some role there with their polarization. That's uh, kind of what led to the Civil War, or at least contributed to it. So they've got a strong kind of statist slash authoritarian streak, but they have a lot of the the usual reasons for people to be more left-leaning or right-leaning, depending on where the voters live. Oh, pretty much, yeah. I want to say, uh, well, I mean, also in Colombia, there's a lot of, there was not insignificant support for left-wing parties in rural areas, but that was more amongst like uh, rural workers, you know, if that's mm -hmm. a thing, like ranch hands and uh, other such people. One of the quid pro quo, quids pro quo in Chile that the uh, left-wing government I mentioned uh, that was in power in the 30s and 40s. One of the quids pro quo they had to make with the conservatives in order to get policies passed was that uh, a lot of policies that they implemented as far as building a stronger welfare state only would apply to urban areas. Rural areas were generally made exempt and that was sort of the price they had to pay uh, in exchange uh, for enough support to get the legislation, to get the pre prerequisite legislation passed. So there is some support for those kinds of left-wing policies in rural areas, but generally uh, conservative politics carries the day frequently. In Colombia, there was a lot of violence between them, you know, left-wing workers and uh, more conservative landowners would fight a lot. 
and that's what fed into uh, La Violencia, sort of the period of violence that preceded uh, the Colombian Civil War. But there were also urban conservatives you know, that kind of spread it around. There was plenty of political divisions everywhere. See, so the next question was, where does Biden's recent focus on restarting student loans come from? Is it a hope that it's a hit he can take now that will be forgotten by next November? I guess I hadn't heard about this. I would thought that they had backed off of the student loan forgiveness. Oh, restarting student loans. There we go. Uh, I think it's partly just something he needs to do in order to appease moderates in the Democratic Party. You know, mansion cinema being sort of the leading examples. You know, there is kind of a desire uh, to try and uh, return to normal, so to speak, and to start winding down some of the COVID support stuff that's been going on. What does this change exactly? Uh, well, I want to say from the start of COVID, like March, April, twenty twenty. One of the things the government did is that they uh, suspended, uh, what, what is it? I think they put everybody's loans on deferment so that you didn't have to pay them, basically. Mm -hmm. The loans were not forgiven, uh, but you also were not penalized for not paying. And I think they might have also wrote it such that interest is not added because normally when you're on deferment the interest basically is just added to your principal amount basically the total amount of the loan uh but in this case i think they actually wrote it so that interest is not accrued uh in that way so that rule has been in place for i want to say almost two years now there's a similar sort of rule I don't know if it's a state specific one in Washington, but they don't, they weren't evicting people for a while for not being able to post rent. And they also didn't have late penalties if you paid your rent later than within the first five days of the month, just a COVID mm -hmm. specific thing. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, a moratorium basically on a, I guess this isn't to do with payment of rent per se, but they had a moratorium on evictions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> which they tried to extend as much as possible, but I think it did finally expire a couple months ago. Uh, but yeah, there was a lot of protections implemented for renters in order to try to make sure that, you know, we didn't just have whole bunches of people getting kicked out and becoming homeless during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's just politics here in this case. You know, he needs to appease moderates. Um, COVID isn't going away per se, but the lockdowns have become much less intrusive. So as the economy returns to normal, the logic for suspending uh, student loan payments kind of weakens basically. So nominally that's the reason. Uh, I don't know that it's just because he wants to do it now and get it out of the way. Although I think there is some logic to that that would make sense in order to get it out of the way now, but I don't know that it would really impact him too much one way or the other, regardless of when he does it. I think uh, the big focus of the Democratic Party right now is very much on people who have traditionally voted Democrat, but voted for Trump. That's kind of more the group that they're targeting, I think. You can kind of see that and how Biden has tried to uh, go out of his way to be like the ultimate moderate politician, basically. Um, and the Democratic Party in general has been kind of very wary uh, of progressivism, so to speak. You know, you can kind of see how averse they are to doing super progressive legislative initiatives. And, uh, you know, that was on full display in the negotiations over both the Build Back Better plan and the infrastructure bill. 
because progressive post, pro progressives in Congress pushed very hard to try to have those be as uh, expansive as possible. But there was significant pushback from moderates in the party. And uh, ultimately, it was the moderates that kind of were able to win the battle. You know, their position in the negotiations were stronger because they could walk away from the bill pretty much. And it wouldn't necessarily have that much of an impact on their uh, likelihood of getting reelected. Whereas the same could not really be said for progressives. So ultimately, I think Democrats are going to try to appear to be as moderate as possible in order to try to win back some of the ground that's been lost uh, to the Trump-style conservatives, Trump-style conservatism. I think it's coming to be called national conservatism. That seems to be the label they're coalescing around. So whether or not they can pull that off remains to be seen. In general, uh, suburban voters have still been pretty skeptical of uh, Donald Trump. So that's a group that Democrats are relatively stronger with, and that's another reason that they've tried to be moderate. Uh, you know, it's not just trying to win back votes that have been lost, but they've also gained votes in uh, moderate suburban districts, and they're looking to try to protect those leads as much as they can. It's so interesting. I feel like there hasn't been a, a left-leaning candidate who really captured the charisma side and was also to able to capture the moderates because you had a Bernie Sanders who he got a lot of the the spirit of the left all fired up but he wasn't able to win the primary mm -hmm. and then Hillary seems quite similar to Biden in terms of being pretty moderate for a, a Democratic candidate yeah yeah she was a focus group granted life by magic <laughs> <laughs> you know just her politics were very much driven by data mm -hmm. and you could see that in her somewhat lackluster presentation you know she talked a lot but then never seemed to say anything if you want to build a broad-based coalition amongst a multitude of different groups it's really hard to be passionate in the things you say without aggravating somebody in the coalition and the result is that the broader the coalition the more watered down the statements tend to be by people trying to lead the coalition. And the Democratic Party is a pretty varied coalition, to put it mildly. Sort of residual union voters, uh, ethnic minorities of one kind or another, and students and progressive urban professionals. It's yeah. not the most organic group. Chat saying that Obama did that. Yeah, I'm remembering that his win was more convincing, I think. Yeah. And it didn't really feel like he was a compromise candidate. And like with every candidate, you're going to make a bunch of promises and not be able to deliver on all of them. But yeah, he was more clearly left than uh, Hillary or Biden have been with which both felt like they're sort of got one foot in the middle, one foot in the left. Yeah, Obama had the advantage of running after the second term of the Bush administration. Right, so people were probably kind of tired of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people really wanted something new, and so they were really willing to uh, give Obama the benefit of the doubt. You know, he seemed like uh, a major departure from the Bush administration. And so people all across the political spectrum really were pretty excited by that. Um, well, obviously, other than other than sort of the right wing of the political spectrum anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think center right people also were generally pretty favorable towards uh, Obama. So center right, center left, left wing. Ended up disappointing a lot of people in the long run, but some of the expectations were set quite high. Yeah. Owing to the circumstances. So probably inevitable. That's the tricky thing with being charismatic, too, is if you get people really fired up and you can articulate a lot of good things that could go through, then it's going to seem a little bit more sparkly and heroic than it'll end up being at the end of the day. Because the U.S. government, and this is a, a common mistake that people make on a regular basis, they overestimate the responsibility and power of the executive office, which has, to their credit, gotten relatively more powerful over time. 
but it's not as though someone can be elected president of the U.S. and then just sh completely shift the direction of the country and start driving really hard in that direction because you've got constant fights in the legislature and then the Supreme Court is kind of doing its thing. So the power is checked and balanced quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, the first two years of the Obama administration is basically where everything happened. And after that, not much. Which is pretty common, right? Because that's the honeymoon period where people are... Basically, the president hasn't had the great opportunities to fuck up yet. <laughs> yeah. So they're not on the public's bad side. And if they want to get anything, anything done, then that's the time to do it. Yeah, that's the time when they're the most popular. They've got, uh, you know, the election mandate to work with. And... Uh, you know, I don't know the data, but, you know, generally, if the president wins, then his party gains seats in the same election. So generally, he has a stronger position in the legislature to work with as well. Mm -hmm. So for the first two years, they did things like Obamacare. Well, they did Obamacare. <laughs> that, was, that was sort of the big one. That took like a year of negotiations. I'm sure there was some other stuff that they did but I feel like they spent all their political capital on that yeah, they came really close to getting it done I think before 2009 no 2010 <clears throat> they wanted to try to do it in 2009 but they ended up having to pass it early 2010 and uh, the, the original version of the bill was only failed because of Ted Kennedy. <laughs> because of course it did. Uh, Ted Kennedy was diagnosed with, well, had already been diagnosed with brain cancer. And so he was very sick. But uh, he just happened to die, like, very soon before the vote was to be held. And that was basically enough uh, to scuttle, sc scutter, wait, forget the word I'm trying to say. Scuttle? Uh, huh? Is the word scuttle? Maybe that's it. But that was enough to scuttle, if that's the right word, the bill. And so they had to uh, renegotiate it. Chat help. And that's where the famous by-election was held, wherein Ted Kennedy's seat was filled by a conservative. I think his name was Scott Hannon, something like that. He'd been a model. <laughs> so people kind of made fun of him a little bit. But because of the because the GOP picked up that seat, they had to make a lot of concessions to the uh, to Scott Hannon in particular, I think, and so that's how we ended up with Obamacare as it is today. There was some weird stuff in the original version of the bill, so maybe that's for the best. I think they were originally gonna. What I think one of the agreements they had to make was that they were going to have the federal government pay all of the medical bills for people in Kansas. Something really bizarre like that. Hmm. Yes, chat says the word is scuttle, like a ship. What about scupper? Scott Brown is the other thing they're saying. Scott Brown, okay. Who's Scott Hannon? <laughs> Sometimes you just have names rolling around in your head. They just come out at inopportune times. You keep track of more names than many people do. I try to. I don't know how successful I am sometimes. I think today in particular I'm scatterbrained. Lots of fuzzy answers. Well, scupper is a word. It has to do with ships, though. Prevent from working or succeeding. There you go. So you can use scupper. I think maybe that's what I was thinking of then. Hmm. Let's see. And we had another one here. Do you see another set of lockdowns with Omicron in the US? I believe recent data is that it is less deadly, but maybe not enough less deadly. I think we're going to see in the next year pretty much exactly what played out in 2021 with Delta. And basically what happened there is that all of the uh, states that were relatively left-leaning, well, not passed, but implemented lockdowns, 
and then the states that were more right-leaning pretty much did the bare minimum. So that's pretty much what I'm expecting again with Omicron. Uh, I suspect the lockdowns will probably be less severe where they happen. I think there is kind of a general shift more towards uh, learning to live with the virus, as the media puts it. Uh, basically just coming to terms with the fact that the virus is endemic. And uh, their policymakers are basically just trying to slowly ease people into that. But uh, if you live in a conservative state, they never, you know, there's not much of an easing process because there's not much to ease people out of. You know, we've, we didn't really do a lot of uh, lockdowns, at least not really severe lockdowns in places like Texas, where I live, uh, for better or worse. So the result then, I think, is that, uh, again, the same pattern will just kind of play out. You know, less severe lockdowns in the uh, blue states, but lockdowns nonetheless, and then red states will just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, meh. Yeah, I don't even necessarily know that uh, the data matters that much to that. I mean, I know that it's supposed to be more contagious, relatively speaking, and that it may or may not be more deadly. Uh, but at this point, lockdowns are more about principle, almost. It's not to say there's not a scientific basis for them, but uh, there's kind of a partisan divide over how to deal with the virus. And so that manifests politically in terms of uh, policy relevant to the virus, which is an unfortunate state of affairs, but it is what it is. But yeah, that would be my expectation at this point. Oh, was there anything else you kind of wanted to touch on? Did you remember the thing? The thing? You were trying to remember something earlier. Oh. Mm, no, not yet. All right. But if it comes to me, I shall alert you. Thank you, sir. Let's see. Well... I did have some notes drawn up just kind of briefly reviewing some stuff that happened in 2021 because there were some trends and stuff we kind of been watching at the beginning of the year. Uh, you know, one of those had to do with uh, just how much the Donald Trump would still maintain his influence over the Republican Party after he lost the 2020 election. And uh, that's something that people in the United States and people also outside of the United States are very interested in. Uh, you know, at this point, there's some question about, uh, well, I mean, after Trump was elected uh, in foreign countries outside of the United States, there was some question as to whether or not Trump was like a permanent phenomenon, like whether he marked a permanent change in U.S. policymaking or whether he was more just a sort of weird outlier, well, basically just a short-term phenomena that would kind of burn out and then things would return to normal afterwards. So he did not win re-election. So that lends evidence, that, that's evidence that it was more of a short-term phenomena, but it's always possible he could come back or that somebody like him could come back and win office. So at this point, uh, outside observers are really looking at just how much influence Trump still has and how much that influence ebbs or uh, increases over time in order to roughly gauge how likely it is that uh, Trumpism, so to speak, is going to determine US policymaking in future. You know, so if uh, Trump's influence seemed to be on the downside, you know, seems to be seemed to be sliding in 2021, that would have significantly lended uh, credibility to the idea that the United States was going to return to something resembling politics as usual. And that would in turn lend a lot more credibility to U.S. assertions that it wanted to reestablish trade links and the trade war, you know, uh, recommit to international security commitments, uh, this kind of stuff. So as is, it's kind of a mixed bag. Because, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, 
polling suggests that the suburbs are still not really on board uh, with Trump. So there, and so without them, it's going to be relatively more difficult to win re-election. So that lends uh, support to the idea that maybe Trumpism is on the decline. But uh, at the same time, there is evidence that, to the contrary, uh, his hold is still pretty strong. I don't know that it would. I don't know that it could be argued that he's really increased his hold on the party, per se. But it hasn't really gotten a whole lot weaker either. And we've kind of seen that with uh, the drama around the congressman, Bobert. Uh, we saw that with the push to have Liz Cheney removed uh, from her seat in Congress. That was an inside job, basically. That was a fight within the Republican Party. You know, Liz Cheney has been very critical of Trump. Uh, from the start and uh, she was definitely one of the voices that came out against him uh, after the whole January 6th drama so there was a big push by the pro-Trump faction in the party to remove her from her seats basically as punishment and they were eventually able to successfully do so uh, there's also all the drama around Matt Gates from this year <laughs> you know uh, there was the pedo thing and then there was the anime video which was more than a little bit silly <clears throat> but uh, he hasn't really quite been punished to the degree some of his detractors would like and the fact that he's gotten sufficient support to avoid that fate uh, again underlines Trumpian influence there in the party Yeah, some more evidence against Trump influence in the Republican Party there was the uh, Republican Party winning the governorship, well, the gubernatorial election in Virginia, which was a surprise because it was expected that the Democrats would be able to pick that up. And uh, from what I remember reading, that was largely a win predicated on suburban voters. So this sort of suburban swing voters were able to kind of change the outcome there. But uh, the Republican governor in question, well, the Republican candidate for governor in question did not run a super Trumpian campaign. So that's the significance of the election. Uh, Republican governor was able to pull out an upset victory, but he did not do it by being super Trumpian in his policy platform. Uh, he very much ran a moderate center-right campaign. So that lends evidence to the Republican Party trying to use as its strategy going forward a more moderate center-right suburban-centered political strategy in order to win office. And if that sounds similar to what I mentioned as far as the Democratic plan, that's no accident. You know, it's very much what both parties are kind of focused on, I think, strategically speaking. Uh, meanwhile, you know, they've got their respective fringe uh, bases that they're trying to kind of appease with the usual sorts of, you know, agitprop in the media. Whether or not that's going to be sufficient to prevent them from defecting is unclear, but... Uh, for now, anyway, it seems like uh, both of them are going to stay loyal. So that's my expectation for 2022, and more specifically with the 2022 midterm elections that are going to come up at the end of the year. I think that uh, both parties will try to focus on moderate suburban voters, but will be severely tested by the more fringe members of their respective parties, both in and outside of Congress. So whichever, whichever party can best corral their fringe, basically, I think will have a big advantage in the election. Let's see. Crime's been going up. That was another phenomena. I don't think it's ever been fully explained. It's probably a lot of different factors, but uh, whatever the determinants, in general, crime in the United States has been on the uptick. And that kind of bucks a long-term trend in which uh, crime had been falling substantially. <clears throat> so that's an unfortunate change there, but uh, it's relevant in so much as it influenced politics. You know, the Republican Party has very much tried to exploit that in order to make the case that the Democrats are the party of uh, defunding police and that the increase in crime must be some kind of outcome of that. Wouldn't that be kind and, of normal with COVID putting economic pressure on people? 
Yeah, that's kind of the intuition. Uh, but there's also been a lot of programs to try to help people through that. And uh, some of it also has to do with actual reforms that have been implemented during COVID as far as uh, not arresting people. You know, like uh, San Francisco recently reversed one of its policies in which they were not arresting like uh, shoplifters because there had been all of the, you know, the high profile uh, shoplifting raids, basically. Hmm. So that was something they did and that obviously incentivized crime. And in New York, one of the things they did, you know, keep in mind, these were well-intentioned policies. You know, they were trying to thin out the number of people who were detained in prisons in order to mitigate spread of the virus. So nominally, that was the uh, objective there. In the case of San Francisco and in the case of New York City, which I believe did the bond reform. So basically they did not go after people who were out on bond or they stopped, no, I think that's what it was. They stopped doing the whole bond program. Somebody from New York City might would probably know this better than me. I'm having trouble remembering the details. But basically the gist of it is that is that uh, without the bond incentive uh, to show up to court, there was a lot of people that were not basically being prosecuted and being sent to jail with a corresponding you know, predictable impact on crime <clears throat> presumably anyway so th there definitely were policies implemented during covid that exacerbated that likely anyway exacerbated crime uh, in terms of weakening enforcement so that was also that also would have been a factor but yeah economic hardship you know definitely would have played a role as well and i remember during the summer one of the explanations is that crime just kind of always goes up during summer so some people were saying the rise in crime was probably just that and that maybe it was just going up more than usual but would go down later in the year but then i don't think it ever actually did if i'm not mistaken so i don't think that explanation necessarily holds water anymore yeah i've heard that there's just a general correlation between outside temperature and crime where if it's warmer people commit more crimes if it's cold people are like you know what Let's commit crimes. Actually, ah, it's cold out today. Screw that. Yeah, I've read. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've read uh, research to the same effect. Yeah, I think that's a pretty well established, uh, stylized fact in the criminal justice literature. I'm trying to remember some of the other determinants and they're just not coming to mind. Let's see if I can, I might be able to find that quickly. Let's see. No, culture, politics. No. I don't see it. Well, it's a di it's a multifaceted research topic. Uh, well, not research. It's a multifaceted phenomena. It's really hard to study crime because a lot of the uh, because the agencies the relevant agencies are not really recording their data in a uniform way and so that makes it difficult to do uh, comparative analysis you know i mean in the united states uh, law enforcement is done by i think literally thousands of local law enforcement agencies uh, which have overlapping authority with state-based law enforcement agencies and also federal law enforcement agencies so there's a lot of different entities uh, whom are, whom are uh, participating in the enforcement of the law and getting data from all of them uh, in the first place can be difficult since they don't all release the same sets of data but even when they even when you can get a complete data set it's not really all completely comparable because there are different ways to estimate different kinds of crime and those different statistics are not entirely comparable So that's one of the difficulties of uh, trying to measure, quote-unquote, crime. 
but then the research into what causes crime also shows that there's just a lot of different factors. So it's kind of hard to pin increases or decreases in crime on any one thing. You know, generally, it's a lot of different things all interacting together. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Anyway, yeah, it's probably increasing for a lot of different reasons. So we'll see what happens as far as uh, what, you know, where the trend goes, whether it continues to rise or whether it falls. Uh, one would think it would fall in winter, but I don't know that it necessarily did. I would have to look at the data uh, to know for sure. Have you seen some of the videos online, Nero, of the uh, shoplifting raids? No. The shoplifters are raiding, or people are raiding the shoplifters? I'm surprised you hadn't seen them. Those were some of the, those are some popular videos on Reddit. Are they funny? Yeah, they had a... I guess I could show them. Let's see. San Francisco is, I think, the main one that I remember watching. Well, basically, uh, what are probably gangs or maybe organized criminal groups will just get a large group of people together and then they'll just rush into a store, grab a bunch of stuff, and then leave. Hmm. And there's been a couple of videos like that. I'm trying to find some. They are not funny, says Moss Neotech. No, no, not as such. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we were taught whenever we were working in retail, so I worked at our money exchange and guess, was if someone is stealing something from the store, it's not your job to stop them or tackle them or whatever. You're supposed to let them go away with it, mainly because that would be putting the employees at risk for something that they're not being paid to put themselves at risk for. Yeah. That would be police and security guards and so on. Let's see. This is one of them, but it's paywalled. Well, anyway, um, you can probably, you can look that up on your own time. I can't, I'm having trouble finding them. But yeah, that's been a phenomenon and people online, you know, argue about it. Like they argue about everything. Hmm. Yes, this is one of them. Oh, anyway, we get to any more. Oh, we had another question. Do you think the deplatforming of Trump directly by the social media networks hurt him, or are the echo chambers established such that it doesn't matter? I think it. I think it definitely hurt him. Because I think one of his big political advantages was just his ability to stay in the news cycle and to paint himself as sort of the antithesis uh, of Democrats or the left or, you know, however you want to characterize them. You know, I remember reading that uh, his administration, uh, specifically his media team, uh, went out of their way to try to design the way that they 
interacted with the media in a way in which they would basically run it like a reality TV show. You know, the idea was that they would try to every day portray Donald Trump as uh, fighting and defeating some kind of opponent. And uh, so that, that was sort of the gist of their media strategy. And, uh, you know, the media definitely played its role in facilitating that by just sort of being outraged, you know, by this, that or the other thing he was doing. And so, you know, their reaction was partly itself the objective, because there's a lot of people who like Trump, who also really hate the media. And uh, anything that the media doesn't like or complains about must then be, be a good thing. So he was able to really use that uh, approach to bolstering his support and appearing as though he was sort of fighting his political opponents to great effect. <clears throat> So yeah, in that sense, I think the deplatforming very much did have an impact, because that was one of his strongest cards. You know, he was very good at that. You know, the tweets, you know, the press conferences, like all of that, was very useful in terms of maintaining the excitement of his core supporters. But since he's been out of the public eye, uh, I think he's had relatively more trouble kind of trying to maintain that momentum. You know, his core of supporters are never going to not like him. They're gonna, you know, they're ride or die with him. So it doesn't really matter that much in that sense uh, that he's been deplatformed. Uh, but I think the longer he stays out of the limelight, the more esteem he loses. And uh, I think he knows that, and I think that's why he's been trying to push so hard to create a kind of alternative media uh set up you know he's tried to he tried to set up like his own blogging thing which i believe fell through and then there was also the attempt to try up like a twitter clone basically i'm not sure anything came of that either yeah i think they were trying to use like another website or something yeah, they were trying to direct people to it but yeah there's there hasn't been a lot of takers or at least not enough in order to kind of really energize the movement So yeah, I think he himself suffered a blow from that. But I would add the caveat that I don't think national conservatism, you know, basically Trump is style conservatism is going away at all. You know, I mean, Donald Trump kind of showed that it could be done. And so now there's going to be imitators. Uh, whether or not those imitators will be as charismatic as Trump or will be as able to mobilize uh, those voters is an open question. I don't know that that's inevitable. It could be that there's no Trump like Trump. And in that sense, once he kind of fades from the political scene, maybe that whole style of politics and movement will kind of fade with time. Uh, but that remains to be seen. That's all kind of in the future. I saw the video clip here of the thieves, 80 thieves ransacked apartment store near San Francisco. And oh, okay. it's definitely a Zerg approach from this video <laughs> I'm seeing here. These aren't, they don't look like world-class thieves who have, they just do thievery that's their job and they're getting like diamonds and shit these look like regular people who all must have like had some chat group of like we're all gonna do this together at the same time but then they just rushed in they've got masks and stuff on and then they rush out and then they just jump in their cars that they used to block the road and drive away I wonder if they all used fake license plates because if not there were cameras pointed on those license plates and well, the thing is, the police have been instructed not to go after them. So even with the license plates, I don't think anything is going to actually happen. Nothing? Yeah, well, I mean, that's that was the idea. They wanted to reduce the number of people in prison. Well, not prisons, but jails, basically. And they also wanted to reduce the workload on police. Uh, and also they wanted the police to be less aggressive in policing. I think that kind of ties in as well. Uh, so basically, there's just a bunch of different crimes, generally minor petty crimes that the police have been instructed not to really pursue. And they uh, did punish. this as a reaction after that went through? Um, who's they? The 80 thieves. Did the 80 oh. thieves hear that this was kind of the new policy and recommendation moving forward of police be less aggressive, don't chase petty crimes, and then they're saying, okay, let's do some petty crimes? Uh, I'm not from San Francisco, so I, I don't know like if they were doing this before they made those changes, but they definitely seem to have been doing them a lot more after. Mm. 
So I would have a hard, I think you would be hard pressed to argue that there's not a correlation there of some kind. And I suspect most people would argue that it has been probably the one most significant factor. Right. Because that's kind of tricky because if they're not pursuing certain crimes, it's almost like they're not crimes. Pretty much, yeah. Because a law without enforcement is an inactive law. Yeah. That's but silly. like I mentioned, uh, the mayor of San Francisco came out recently and said they were going to start changing that. So hmm. I suspect they're going to crack down pretty soon. Someone said it doesn't hurt anyone because you steal from large corporations. The large corporation would not have been affected by some of their merchandise being taken away. If anything, I gave them free publicity. So yeah, that statement doesn't really hold too much water. It makes their it store look desirable too. So there's other stunts that companies have done for movies. Like I was reading one about for the new James Bond movie, they needed to make the roads like really slick or maybe it was sticky or something. They needed to do something to the roads. So they dumped like a million dollars of Coca-Cola or something on the road when they could have just used water with food coloring or sugar water or something like that. And it would have been way cheaper, but it was worth it for Coca-Cola to do the stunt. So in this case too, maybe the people who are rushing in, they think they're sticking it to the man or something when it, that's straight up going to backfire. Yeah. Just don't go to the store. You're still going to the store. And if anything, you'd probably stick it to the company more if you just bought it like a normal person than if you put them on the news. It would be interesting to get some stats from this. Like, what is the average theft amount of each of these 80 people? Because if it was just a run in, grab stuff, and get out, they're not going to have, like, tons of super valuable stuff. It's basically going to be what each person can carry with their hands. I don't know. And now I'm thinking of like, what was their loot distribution method? <laughs> they lead a WoW guild, so it's like, all right, you got all that loot from the store. Is it just what everyone could grab and you just keep what you can grab? Or do you yeah. all meet up at a rendezvous point later and then DKP that shit? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure just what the supply chain is there. I imagine that they pawn some of it or maybe sell it online. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, they're sufficiently well organized that they must have some kind of plan there. So presumably they have a way to liquidate the assets and get money from them. But I don't know what that would be. Let's see. There was a great wave of locusts in West Africa during the start of COVID. Do you have anything to say about the impact of that? Actually, I'm pretty sure it was East Africa, not West Africa. Because I remember Ethiopia and Kenya being particularly impacted. I think they started to spread West, but I don't think there was a, I don't think they spread that far. Was this the one where they sent in the ducks? They never did send in the ducks. What? But, but they, they were thinking have. about it. The Pakistanis in particular, I believe, were thinking about it. You should send in the ducks. That would be awesome. <laughs> we had a fun conversation with that one many episodes ago. So basically, you've got unusual amounts of locusts that are just rolling in and messing stuff up. And then you got to think, like, how can we get rid of these locusts? And a lot of people would say, well, you could use bug spray, but that's bad for the environment. You could use ducks because ducks eat locusts. And that's a genius move until the ducks get overpopulated. And then you've got to find what is the natural predator of ducks and just airdrop in a whole bunch of whatever that is. Get some giant condors from South America or something. They could take out some ducks. There you go. 
Well, I don't. I haven't followed the Locust story too much since 2020, because they started to bring it under control in early 2021, and it's just kind of been out of the news cycle. So I can't say I've really heard anything about it. I would assume that it's not that bad, or that it's been you know corralled. I think somebody sent me a map here in Discord, and they. There seems to still be some locust activity, but I don't know if that's unusual. Because I think it is partly seasonal. But as for the impact that locusts have, I think they were able to deal with it such that the impact was not too bad. I think it mostly impacted farmers more than anything, since they would swoop in and eat all their crops. And I don't think I ever remembered reading anything about uh, mass starvation in Ethiopia or anything like that. So presumably they were able to contain it, at least to that degree. Yeah, I think they pretty well handled it pretty much. It was just really massive, so it was very difficult to do, but I think they did end up sufficiently dealing with it that it's not that it didn't end up having quite uh, the dire economic consequences that it might have yeah I do remember there were still locusts around when the civil war started in Ethiopia which kind of begs the question of whether or not there was some fighting amidst the locust swarms that would be pretty dramatic mm-hmm they could just build a coalition with the locusts and try to turn them to one of the sides. There you go. Yeah, I guess I don't have a whole lot to add to that. Let's see. Do you have any book recommendations to get started into world politics or politics in general? Thank you very much. Okay. Hmm. Gosh, most of the stuff I learned about politics, I just learned in college. So I guess textbooks. <laughs> Did you have a class that stood out to you as being particularly useful? Uh, not any one class. I mean, I learned about institutions when I was in grad school. I had a class on that. Uh, I had a class on the politics of China, for example. When I was an undergrad, I had a class on the European Union. Uh, and of course, like everybody who was an undergrad, I had, you know, the political science prerequisites. Uh, what was that? Politics of Texas and then politics of the United States. Uh, yeah, just all together, pretty much. I just kind of learned more over time. I'm sure some uh, poli-sci guy would have more specific reading in question more specific re reading to recommend, rather. Yeah, I do remember there was one particular book that was about... Uh, it was about Congress, and it had to do with lobbying. And specifically, it kind of delved into uh, how legislation was passed, how lobbying interacted with that, uh, etc. Actually, it wasn't about lobbying, but there was a chapter on lobbying. That's what it was. And uh, that book had been a cornerstone of poli-sci reading for decades. It was actually originally written in the 70s, so it's a little bit dated, but uh, the research still has some relevant things to say. You know, that was the book where I first read the argument that lobbying was not so much about money as it was about access. So, you know, you don't have to bribe politicians to do what you want. You just pay somebody who's really smart to go and convince them that voting a certain way is in their best interest. That sounds like secondhand bribing, but <laughs> just get someone with a super high persuasion score who can do a Jedi mind trick on them to get them to vote that way. You still end up having to pay someone for the end result, but it's done through a persuasion check and not through a, a direct bribe. Well, most of the donations that are made are made to... Uh politicians that have lots of constituents who work in a given industry. 
So it doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense uh, because obviously they're going to vote in ways that protect that industry because that would protect the jobs of their constituents. Mm -hmm. So why would lobbyists then focus so much on them? You would think it would make more sense to spend money on other politicians who maybe don't have any particular vested interest in protecting a given industry, such that those industries would then try to spend lots of money lobbying them. So why is that not the case? And the answer is access. You know, you go to the guy who has a vested interest in defending a given industry and you try to inform him as much as possible so that he doesn't do something stupid. Because obviously there's lots of different interest groups uh, that'll try to convince you of one thing or another, you know, to vote against, uh, well, to vote for a given bill because it helps uh, a given side in like a quid pro quo, for example, like there's lots of what's called log rolling in Congress, where you basically trade a vote on one thing you don't have an interest in in exchange for something else. So in the course of that, somebody may convince you that a given vote won't hurt an industry in your district when maybe it does. And so lobbyists basically try to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and then also they try to make sure that uh, politicians try to construct legislation as favorably as possible uh, to their industry, which, com which politicians are generally not capable of doing because they're not generally sufficiently well versed in the details of the technical side of an industry to know how to do that. Uh, nor are they generally familiar enough, familiar enough with the technical side of drawing up legislation uh, to know how to do that. You know, the legislation itself tends to get drawn up by staffers rather than politicians. And so some of the details of that process are also uh, consulted. Well, some of the details of that process are also referred to lobbyists so that they can have input. So it's not outright bribery per se. It's more about influencing outcomes, you know, influencing the details of legislation and making sure that uh, given politicians are aware of how best to defend their constituents' interests. I might add here that when people talk about lobbyists, they almost always think of like corporate lobbyists, but there's actually lots of lobbyists who lobby for things like environmental NGOs, for example, uh, who are not lobbying for explicitly profitable purposes. You know, they're not just trying to defend the bottom line somewhere. Uh, lobbying is something that's done by every interest group in the United States, corporate or not. So it's a very wide ranging industry in that sense. I guess I haven't... <laughs> I guess that doesn't do a very good job of answering the question. Um, political books. I need to read something other than textbooks. I could have something better to recommend people. Uh, world politics. For world politics, you might try something by Henry Kissinger, which is going to be a controversial recommendation. Uh, but he wrote a book, I think, 20 years ago that kind of breaks down a lot of the leading issues uh, at the time, anyway. But he kind of breaks them down in a realist way, which kind of illustrates the realist school of thought pretty well. Uh, you know, if you really want to learn more about world politics or politics in general, I don't know that books are ne necessarily the best way to go. You know, if you really want to learn more about them, you can do something like subscribe to newsletters and, uh, you know, read articles on uh, websites that specialize in given issues. You know, I mean, if you just follow something like Politico, for example, every day and try to, you know, try to read some of the more in-depth articles there, you know, you'll, you'll learn something just from that if you do it for long enough anyway. And you would try to avoid the clickbaity stuff. You know, even, even relatively partisan outlets will produce pretty good content. Uh, they'll generally kind of editorialize it in a biased way, but you know, some of the technical details that they slip in are pretty useful. Yeah, I guess try to find technical stuff. 
if you can find information on that, that's generally better. So like uh, information on polling, for example, is pretty useful and polling information because that's the kind of data that drives decision-making within the political parties. Well, just any political party, really. So if you kind of know that, then you'll know the kind of information that they're looking at and you can kind of better form an idea of how they're strategizing. So, you know, like I talked about before, in general, the polling shows that uh, suburbanites kind of lean away from Trump. So that with that kind of data point, how would you strategize a political campaign? So you can kind of analyze the things that the political parties are doing with that in mind. And newsletters are nice because that's the kind of information that a lot of journalists use. Uh, you know, obviously they have personal contacts and a lot of experience to tap, but, uh, you know, newsletters are also pretty useful. If you want, I could just give you a list, <laughs> a list of newsletters. Yes. I actually tried to write them down so I could keep track of them. I don't read all of the newsletters that I subscribe to. I just uh, ex was experimenting this past year with a newsletter ba based information model. So at first I tried to read them all and that quickly became very impractical. So now I kind of refer to a couple of them more frequently and then others I'll go to if there's a specific issue I want more information on. Newsletter. Newsletter. Oh. Different thing. Well, if I could find it, I would anyway. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I have a lot of notepad files. It's a good program. I still use it. It's a no-nonsense yeah. approach. does one thing well. Yeah. sure just what I did with it. Well, if you're interested in getting a list of newsletters that you might find of interest, if you're looking to learn more about uh, world politics, economics, and more specifically, current events, uh, you can email me and I'll send you the list here. And you can kind of pick out the stuff that you're most interested in. His email is in the who is it command. Yeah, what is it? John TX 1848 gmail.com That's going to bug the hell out of me. What did I do with it? <laughs> How are we doing on time? You got a good 45 minutes to an hour. 45 minutes to an hour. Oh, is there anything you wanted to get to? Mm. Was there an update on Russia and Ukraine? There's someone during the week who asked about that. I don't think so. I think the Russians are still building up. I think the Russians did come out with like a specific proposal. They wanted uh, a reduction in the US troop presence in Eastern Europe. And they wanted uh, guarantees that Ukraine would not join, join NATO. But I don't know that that's any different than the stuff they were asking for before. That was That's the only thing that kind of comes to mind from the past week. Chad is asking think... about uh, Belarus and migrants. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, Belarus started sending uh well they announced that they were going to have a visa program that had like very that was very accessible. And so they started advertising that very prominently in the Middle East and uh a lot of organized criminal groups in the region started using that in order to sign up people to send them to Belarus, which is what the Belarusian government wanted. They wanted to attract migrants to Belarus so that they could send them across the border, uh, specifically across the border with Lithuania, I think, also Poland. And they wanted to do that as a form of pressure. They were trying to lean on uh, Europe partly related to the Ukraine issue, probably, but I think they also had their own reasons. I think the Europeans were trying to put pressure on the Belarusian government over, I don't know, this, that, or the other human rights abuse. It's a pretty decent sized list at this point, so could be any one of them. But yeah, they tried to do that to put pressure on Europe, and it was pretty successful for a while. You know, there was a number of migrants who made the crossing. Uh, but eventually, the Lithuanian and Polish government started to crack down. They even started uh, forcing people back across the border, which is technically illegal. <laughs> but they did it anyway. And I don't think people in Europe complained too much about it, because they kind of saw the uh, intention behind it, that it was a pressure campaign by uh, Lukashenko and Belarus. So they more or less turned a blind eye. And so at this point, the campaign to pressure Europe has largely failed. And I think uh, the number of migrants that have been trying to cross has fallen significantly as a result. I think I was reading an article about that not too long ago. In Belarus, they don't really have the greatest number of personal liberties. Uh, one might go so far as to say they have none. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an authoritarian dictatorship it's not even really a one-party state it's just a one dude state yeah lukashenko was a um he was like the head of a farming cooperative or something back when the soviet union was still intact and then he ran as a nationalist in the uh, first free elections and was able to win office and has never looked back pretty much Yeah, I think the thing that Lukashenko did different than the other post-Soviet leaders is that he maintained a lot of Soviet institutions. Like, he didn't blow open the economy and try to liberalize it like a lot of states did. He pretty much maintained a lot of the command economy that the Soviets had. Mm. He even kept the KGB. <laughs> clinging more tightly to the property of inertia? Uh, not inertia. I think it was popular. You know, a lot of the uh, older voters in particular appreciate that uh, they were able to maintain access to their pensions at a time when in uh, Russia a lot of people lost their pensions. Yeah, that would not be a fun thing to have happen. Yeah. So where a lot of places in Eastern Europe were pretty wild and woolly in the 90s on account of the economic transition from a command economy to a free market economy, Belarus was much more stable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people appreciated that. So a lot of people in Belarus associate Lukashenko with stability. And uh, given the other stuff happening in the region, that's a pretty good characteristic for a politician to have. And he exploits that. You know, the core of his support is pretty much people who value stability above all else. And there's enough people in Belarus who think like that to keep him in power, pretty much. Wonder of it, how much of it was him versus the structures around him? Because it's reminding me of the statement I made earlier today talking about how the U.S. president oftentimes gets the credit or the blame for stuff that happens during their tenure, but there are checks and balances. I would guess the government of Belarus doesn't quite have as many checks and balances and the executive is comparatively more powerful by a lot. Uh, yeah, pretty much all power is centered in the office of the president. You know, it's basically a giant patronage network with Lukashenko on top and then he gives resources to people uh, in exchange for loyalty. Hmm. 
So the legislature isn't really a legislature. It's just a bunch of guys that he pays to do what he tells them to do. Put on suits, show up here this time, just fluff about papers. <laughs> yeah. And then when I tell you to pass something, just check the box. Yeah, and the security services in particular are an important part of that network, because obviously they're the ones who have the power to kill them if they want. So you have to treat them well. Kill Lukashenko? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, he has to be nice to the people with guns. Yeah, exactly. So you have to keep them pleased, at least nominally. And one of the things that happened at the height of the protests was that uh, they started importing Russians, specifically Russian policemen. And that uh, bolstered the ranks, basically, of the pro-Lukashenko people amongst the uh, security institutions. You know, if there was any doubt that uh, the security institutions were going to stick with them, that doubt was sort of uh, dealt with once it was apparent that there were Russians there. Because obviously, Russian policemen you import specifically for the purpose of uh, maintaining the regime in power are not going to defect. They have no incentive to. Mm -hmm. Just there to get paid. Probably. Pretty much. Now, they may have been paid by the Russian government. Obviously, the Putin administration has an incentive to keep Lukashenko in power. Lukashenko has kind of tried to play Russia off the West for a while, for a long time, because he didn't want to be too dependent on either one. Mm -hmm. But then after the crackdown on the protests, the West kind of felt alienated. And so they kind of put distance between them. And uh, the result is that Lukashenko has turned much more towards Russia in the past few years. So he's very much in the Russian camp at this point, and that means that Putin definitely has an incentive to help him out. Yes, these papers are very interesting. They say, do what the boss says. Hmm. This is government. Let's see. What else did I have in here? Let's see, I was working through that. Oh, yeah. There was an attempt to do some uh, electoral reform. You know, that was one of the big things people were talking about after 2020. You know, there was kind of a perceived need to update electoral institutions mm -hmm. in the United States to avoid any potential future shenanigans. Mm -hmm. So obviously that didn't go anywhere. Uh, There's just too much opposition. And pretty much all of the focus in 2021 was on uh, Build Back Better and the infrastructure bill. So there just wasn't really political capital to do much else. Uh, there was a push to kind of water down the electoral reform bill and to just kind of do bare minimum. And that was the Joe Lewis Voting Rights Act, if I'm not mistaken. And so there was some discussion about whether that was more likely to pass. Uh, did not end up happening. Uh, there was like a recent push just like in the past couple of days to kind of bring it back so that they could accomplish something in December, but nothing happened there either. But uh, that's something that we can probably look forward to in 2022. Because I suspect what's going to happen is that uh, the Democrats are going to really push hard to try to get Build Back Better passed in early 2022. And then I suspect they're going to look at pretty hard at voting rights as a uh, political issue. So I suspect we'll be hearing about that considerably. But yeah, in 2021, nothing doing. Let's see, what's, what else is worth commenting on here? Yeah, not a lot of drama in foreign policy, really. 
I think the Biden, there was a question as to just how, just what exactly the Biden administration would do in order to repair relations with everybody, <laughs> pretty much. And uh, overall, it's been a pretty bland effort, but overall successful. I think uh, Europe is still a little hesitant because they still don't know whether or not Trump is going to be back in the future. So there's still kind of some hesitancy to kind of fully engage. Uh, but in general, Europe is pretty pleased that the United States has been trying to kind of meet with them in, uh, and in the way that the Biden administration has dealt with trade disputes. So there was like uh, some drama about steel. You know, Trump, the Trump administration implemented steel tariffs, uh, steel and aluminum tariffs, actually. And so uh, that was an outstanding issue at the beginning of 2021. And that's been resolved. You know, there was a deal struck in order to kind of remove uh, those steel tariffs. Uh, there was some drama over digital taxes, but I think that was kind of dealt with with the uh, global minimum tax agreement that was reached. There was also an agreement on the Airbus issue. I mean, for those not familiar with this, there's a company in Europe called Airbus that is one of the le world's leading producers of commercial aircraft. And uh, for decades, there's been a back and forth disagreement between the United States and the European Union over subsidies to Airbus. Uh, the Europeans provide lots of subsidies to the company to try to ensure that it's competitive. And the, the United States believes that's unfair uh, and that fair trade dictates that subsidies be minimal or non-existent. So the Europeans come back and argue that uh, Boeing, which is roughly the American equivalent of Airbus, receives lots of subsidies at a local level, if not also a state level. And so there was lots of disagreement about that, tit for tat tariffs, and then eventually there was an actual agreement reached this year. So basically just general progress on the trade relationship between the United States and Europe. Uh, so that's all to the positive. And the fact that it was done in a way that was not super drama, you know, that was not, that did not seek attention in the media, that was also appreciated. You know, the Trump administration was very much about trying to uh, make every interaction with another government into a source of media speculation, a media circus, basically. And uh, the Biden administration has basically just tried to do the opposite. So probably that more than anything has been appreciated, but also progress in the trade relationship also appreciated. Yeah, and that would be making a circus regardless of whether his stance was favorable or unfavorable. Yeah. Like, oh, look, we're meeting with Putin, and I'm so smiley, and this is something that other presidents didn't have the courage to do. Oh, look, it's Kim Jong-un. Wow, we're going to meet with him? Other presidents didn't do that. That's amazing. Oh, but he's tough on China. Damn. They're going to get tariffed. Yeah, there was considerable theater during that four years. Uh, the UK still has some outstanding steel issues with the United States. Uh, the steel agreement that was the steel agreement that was struck between the US and the European Union did not include the UK for obvious reasons. The UK isn't a part of the European Union anymore. Uh, but the United States just hasn't really focused much on negotiating with the UK over trade issues, presumably because it's just not enough of a priority. So the British government hasn't been too happy about that. They have been hoping for progress on trade talks, but uh, they've been disappointed, basically. So we'll see if there's some more progress in 2022. Uh, there's going to be more bandwidth, relatively speaking, since the Europeans have been dealt with, uh, well, the European Union, rather. So there may be room for progress then going forward. Oh, the Germans in particular appreciated the uh, Biden administration going easy on them on the whole Nord Stream thing. The Nord you know, those Stream are... thing? Yeah, so the Germans and the Russians were building, have been building a gas pipeline. And uh, the thing about this pipeline is that it was built in the North Sea. Or no, not the North Sea, the Baltic Sea. And uh, so that meant that the pipeline went directly from Russian territory to German territory. It did not. It does not go through any intermediary uh, states. And the the significance of that is that historically, uh, natural gas piped from Russia to Germany has gone through other states like uh, Ukraine or Belarus. And so what that meant is that Ukrainian or Belarusian governments 
have had leverage over Russia in so much as they could shut down the flow of gas to Europe, which would, of course, have consequences on gas revenue for the Russian government. Mm. So by building a pipeline directly to Germany, uh, those intermediate states like Belarus, Ukraine, etc., lose a lot of their leverage vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, so there was some concern that the Germans building the pipeline meant that they were going to basically just ignore Eastern Europe and that they were just going to care solely about their own natural gas supply. But uh, I think those concerns were largely overblown. Obviously, the Ukrainian government in particular, given its tensions with Russia, has been upset about it. But uh, from the German perspective, it makes a lot of sense. They don't want their natural gas supply to be at the mercy of uh, volatile governments you know, who potentially could be invaded by Russia. Uh, but they've also gone out of their way to say that they're not going to just abandon Eastern Europe to Russia just because they built this pipeline. You know, it just it gives them leverage vis-a-vis -vis those governments. And that's probably as much as, you know, Eastern Europe is probably as upset about that fact as it is about the fact that uh, they're losing leverage over Russia. But overall, the Germans have sent credible signals that they're going to continue to work with uh, Ukraine in particular, but also Eastern Europe in general. And keep in mind that, you know, when the Russians were trying to use natural gas as a tool through which to influence European politics, uh, the Germans and the rest of the Europe were pretty quick to create a mechanism by which natural gas contracts with Russia were negotiated at a, as a block, as opposed to individually country to country. So that obviously eliminated a lot of the leverage Russia had in those negotiations, especially with smaller states. So Russia's leverage here is relatively limited to begin with. And uh, Germany, I think, has every you know reason to not abandon Ukraine and you know, Eastern Europe. So I feel like the concerns were always, were always pretty overblown on that. And uh, I think the Trump administration kind of knew that. You know, they nominally complained about the uh, Nord Stream pipeline project, but they never really did much about it either. And I, you know, you could kind of sense the trend across multiple presidential administrations that the U.S. was probably going to end up letting the construction of the pipeline go forward without significant consequence. So the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration have been a pretty like mind on that. Technically, they did apply pressure on the Germans to not build it, but the pressure was pretty mild in the grand scheme of things. Give them the old strongly worded letter pressure. That'll teach you. Yeah. yeah, there were some threats about sanctioning companies involved with the project, but uh, that threat never had much credibility because the, you know, the companies in question were not afraid of being sanctioned, basically. There was no, you know, if they had been sanctioned, they would not have lost business, really. You know, it wouldn't have cut them off from any of their significant clients. Uh, let's see. There was also an attempt to build up solidarity with Europe on China. So there was a big effort there to try to create a common bloc that could negotiate with China on stuff like trade issues and whatnot. But that kind of fell flat this year, which was unfortunate. Um, in general, most of Europe was on board with it, but the German government was pretty reluctant. You know, Germany has pretty strong trade ties with uh, China. And so they're a little reluctant to go along with a project which could see them cast as being anti-China, so to speak. So not as much progress on that front as uh, some you know, foreign policy experts would have liked. There was also the Summit for Democracy, but pretty much nothing is going to come of that. So, yeah, kind of a dead letter. My 45 minutes up. Nope. You got another 20 unless you're tired. I think we got some more questions in. Oh, did we? Yeah. Oh yeah, I guess we did. Do you think the questionable monetary policies in Turkey will lead to instability and another possible coup as the lira continues its free fall? It's going to lead to instability for sure. But it may be that the Turkish government kind of waits until the last minute and then changes course in order to avoid the worst of the damage. But whether or not a coup is likely, I'm a little skeptical about that. 
I don't know if that's really probable because the Erdogan government in uh, Turkey has gone very far out of its way to try to root out institutional resistance to his rule. So a lot of people in government have been uh, purged basically from their jobs for any perceived links to, for example, uh, Gulenism, which was, you know, Gulenists had been allies of Erdogan and the AKP, but after the coup attempt in 2016, I think it was, he went after them pretty hard. So they had a big falling out, and the result is that pretty much all of those people have been removed from office. But the criteria by which they were removed was super ambiguous. It was pretty much just enough to have gone to a Gulenist school growing up, and they would fire you just for that. But it was also a convenient excuse to just to fire people who were not loyal enough, basically, to Erdogan. So some of that extended to the military, but it's not entirely clear how much. So the degree to which the military has been tamed in Turkey is an open question. You know, it could be that he's sufficiently cowed the military that they would not challenge him, but it also could be that the military is just lying low and that they're actually still a bastion of institutional resistance. It's a little ambiguous at this point. But I don't know that they would move now. I mean, even with all of the uh, economic drama, the AKP still has a lot of support. You know, Erdogan remains very popular amongst his core supporters. So I don't think the military would want to move, given that if they did launch a coup, they would end up having to fight basically half the country, which is not an appealing prospect. I think Erdogan's popularity would have to fall pretty significantly for them to really want to do that. I could be wrong. You know, maybe they would, you know, maybe they think it's worth it to move now, but, uh, you know, given the fact that the military did not really rally to the 2016 coup, I kind of suspect they're not that interested without a significant change in political circumstances. Are you familiar with the uh, monetary policy of Turkey right now, Nero? I'm not. What is their monetary policy? You. Do they not have one? Is that the joke? <laughs> no, no, no. Nothing, nothing so dramatic. No, they do have a stupid one, though. So there is that. Uh, basically, when your economy is doing really well and is producing a lot, generally that means you're going to have some inflation. And so the thing to do in that case is to raise interest rates. So that happened in Turkey. That is to say the economy just started running hot. Uh, but... The Turkish government has put a lot of pressure on Turkey's central bank to not raise interest rates. In fact, they've been pushing them to lower interest rates, which they've done several times. So this is very much not the correct approach. And uh, uncertainty about the independence of the central bank has led to uh, some concern on the part of foreign investors such that they've been pulling their money out, and that's exacerbated the problem. Uh, so withdrawal of foreign investment has led to a decline in the lira, you know, the currency of Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally what you would do when your currency devalues is raise interest rates. But once again, there's been a lot of political pressure on the central bank to not do that. So even as the currency is falling and even as there's inflation in the economy, uh, the Turkish government refuse basic, refuses basically to allow the central bank to increase interest rates which would nominally deal with both problems so there's been corresponding drama within the turkish economy on that count mm. you know the currency just continues to lose value uh the currency falling itself causes inflation and so that causes knock-on problems as far as uh, goods getting more expensive, cost of living getting more expensive, etc. And they're not allowed to implement the usual solutions to this problem. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there's a pretty orthodox set of economic tools that you should use policy-wise in these circumstances. And the government is just dead set opposed to it for reasons that are not entirely clear. Um, Erdogan himself has said that... Uh, he basically has his own notions of economics that he thinks are more correct than orthodox economics, mm. which is probably bullshit. I suspect he's kind of making that up, but nominally that that is the excuse he's given. I suspect the real reason 
is that uh, his patronage network is partly dependent on cheap loans. You know, a big part of his patronage network in Turkish politics is construction companies. And uh, a lot of them are, you know, either take out loans themselves or are paid with loans from the government. And uh, making sure those loans are sufficiently cheap as to be serviceable in the long run is a part of the quid pro quo between his supporters in the construction industry and himself. Mm. So is it really due to his better understanding of economics or him pandering to his base? Because it sounds like he's just pandering to his base and then chalking it up as, I know better than the experts on this, trust me. Yeah, it's probably pandering. That's my best guess. There's also the fact that a lot of Turkish companies have run up debt over the past couple decades, which is largely denominated in foreign currency, which means that uh, if they have to pay, well, they have to pay back the debt, but when they pay back the debt, they have to pay uh, in things like euros or dollars rather than in Turkish lira. And given that the Turkish lira is devaluing, and given that most of these companies do business in the Turkish lira, uh, the fact that the currency is devaluing means that it's getting relatively harder to pay back those loans. Because uh, the currency, uh, the Turkish lira is becoming less valuable, but the loans are staying the same in value, which means that in real terms, uh, it's getting more expensive to pay back the loan. So that hurts a lot of companies also. So it may be that he's trying to ensure they can continue to turn over debt, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm not real sure. He kind of got a temporary reprieve in 2020 because there was a uh, cooperative effort on the part of central banks around the world to do currency swaps. So there was a bunch of foreign currency that was injected basically into Turkey's banking system as a result of that. That was done as a, re as a response to COVID. There was a kind of a combined effort on the part of central banks around the world to increase liquidity, uh, to have you know basically a looser monetary policy in order to try to stimulate economic growth, uh, or you know, probably more accurately to somewhat mitigate the damage done by COVID. So the banking sector in Turkey got some hard currency as a result. So they were able to temporarily uh, prolong their inevitable reckoning with that debt. But they may be running out of time. <laughs> you know, they can't they can't play games like that forever. Mm -hmm. So presumably, there's going to be some kind of financial crisis in Turkey at some point, just because of the lack of foreign investment and foreign currency and the continued devaluation of the lira. I would assume at some point that something will happen, but it could be that when that something is imminent the turkish government changes course in order to avoid it so that's also quite possible but i imagine in that case there's going to be some alternative mechanism by which erdogan maintains his hold on his patronage network uh, some of the natural gas shenanigans in the eastern mediterranean are probably part of that you know for those of you not following mediterranean security news which i imagine is most people uh, the Turkish government has been claiming natural gas fields in disputed territory in the eastern Mediterranean. And the suspicion, well, my suspicion anyway, is that the Erdogan government has been doing that just so that they can earn some money from uh, natural gas companies. You know, Obviously, it takes a lot of time to exploit natural gas deposits, especially ones that are you know underwater. Uh, but you can still make some money in the short term selling things like uh, leases, you know, selling legal rights to exploit. So that's been the source of some revenue for the Turkish government, which I suspect is their main motivation there. Yeah, some of the adventurism in Libya is also probably related to that. Uh, there's some part of the quid pro quo for Turkish support in the Libyan civil war with the officially UN recognized government of Libya. Uh, was that the Libyan government would recognize disputed Turkish claims, well, would recognize Turkish claims on disputed territory in the Eastern Mediterranean. They also renegotiated some of the uh, borders, basically, between uh, Libya and Turkey. That sounds weird, I know, but basically the way it worked out is that Libya conceded some territory in the Mediterranean to Turkey, that Turkey would have the exclusive right to exploit. I imagine there was probably also some oil contract stuff going on since Libya produces a lot of oil, but I don't think I ever remember reading much about that. But anyway, basically it's just all about getting foreign currency. 
That seems to be the principal motivation there. So in that sense, maybe something we could look forward to in 2022 is the Turkish government becoming increasingly adventurous in its foreign policy in an effort to generate money. Which is kind of funny because the Russian government is pretty much doing the same thing. So it's resulted in something of a uh, Russo-Turkish joint effort, basically, to expand their patronage networks outside of their borders. Turkey is doing better in North Africa, I would say. North Africa and the Middle East. Russia is doing better in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think we've talked before about uh, Russia Afrique. That is to say, Russia's growing sphere of influence in Africa, which is basically supplanting the French sphere of influence. But yeah, to get, I guess, to bring this full circle, uh, yes, I think that monetary policy in Turkey is going to lead to more instability in Turkey, but I don't think that it'll lead to another coup. That seems relatively unlikely. Are there any other countries in that region that have had anything noteworthy happen recently? In the Middle East? And we touched Belarus. How's Syria been? They're kind of doing their usual thing. Yep. <laughs> Lots of violence. Lots of violence. Still split with that uh, smaller ethnic group that has more power in the main government. Rebels still rebelling. Yeah, the thing... Well, okay, let me rephrase. Syria has kind of stabilized. You know, there's not like major offensives anymore, really. So there's, it's basically becoming more and more a frozen conflict. You know, it's not com it's not completely a frozen conflict yet because there is still some fighting, some skirmishing here and there. Uh, but there's not really like su substantive sustained pushes to try to seize territory like there used to be. Uh, the Syrian civil war has basically transformed now into more of a shadow war. And it's a lot more about assassinations and you know, diplomatic maneuvering and that kind of thing. More it's like ninjas. Anything. Well, I don't know about ninjas, but <laughs> certainly a lot of clandestine activity. Uh, one of the things I remember reading from the past year was a uh, program of assassinations within Kurdish territory. Basically, uh, Kurdish leaders uh, were being targeted probably by the Syrian government, but possibly also by Turks, since the Turkish government doesn't get along with them either. So there was some question about whether or not the United States was doing enough to protect, protect Kurd Kurdish allies, uh, given that they were being targeted in this way. But the counter argument there is that the Kurd, well, the Kurdish militias that the United States is allied to in eastern Syria themselves became more aggressive in the past year. There was an effort uh, on the part of an enclave uh, in what central northern Syria, which is held by the Kurds, starting to skirmish more. Uh, with the surrounding territory, which was largely held by uh, Free Syrian Army forces, which are aligned with Turkey. So, in that sense, the Kurds may have brought it on themselves, in so much as they did that on their own initiative. And uh, given that, probably no surprise the United States didn't really do more to jump in on their behalf. So, Turkish pressure on the Kurds in eastern Syria and continued support to the Free Syrian Army in Idlib province, which is the main rebel-held province in Syria right now. And then uh, Iranian activity in support of the Syrian government, but also just Iranian buildup of forces in Syria in general as a way to pressure Israel. That kind of ties into the nuclear talks, since you know when, when Iran wants to pressure the West, specifically the United States, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, nuclear negotiations, sometimes they'll put pressure on Israel specifically since they tend to conflate Israel and the West, given how close they are, you know, in terms of foreign policy. So Syria's quid pro quo with Iran is that uh, Iran supports the Syrian government and provides them with resources, you know, money, oil, whatnot, if not also weapons. And in exchange, the Syrian government has to allow them to basically uh, build bases in Syria and use it as a platform to project power into uh, that region of the Middle East. And then the United States just kind of has its thumbs up its ass. There's just no, there just hasn't ever been any real strategic direction 
to America's Syrian policy. So our policy basically is to support the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is basically our de facto Kurdish ally in Eastern Syria, and to make sure they don't get steamrolled. But other than that, we don't have like wider aspirations. We don't have a diplomatic plan to negotiate peace between the different factions. We don't support the Kurds so that they can take over you know, Syria. We don't sponsor any uh, negotiations between the Kurds and the Syrian government so that they can reconcile. We just don't really do much of anything. We just could kind of there. We could speak out at certain actions that are taken in the region. That's about it. You know, there's just no strategic impetus there, no no strategic momentum. So we're a player and we have the potential to completely change the tenor of the conflict. You know, I mean, we could overthrow Assad if we wanted to. We could pull out and just let Assad have the Kurdish territories. Um, and if we did one or the other, the conflict would probably resolve within a year or two. But because we just don't know what to do with the influence we have in Syria, we're just sort of stuck. And so long as we are the other two factions, you know, the Turks and the Syrians specifically, don't really have a clear path forward. You know, I mean, hypothetically, the Turks and the Kurt, the, well, the Turks and the Syrians rather, could negotiate an agreement, uh, you know, reaching peace. Uh, but such an agreement would have to resolve the issue of the Kurds in the eastern Syria. And the Turks can't realistically deliver on anything there, you know, because they can't kind of go against the United States. I'm sure some, I'm sure they would want to. They don't like the Kurds any more than the Syrian government does, but uh, they can't realistically dislodge the United States from the region. So that's kind of a problem as far as any potential Syrian Turkish rapprochement. Like there would have to be something there in order to move forward there. But then the Turks can't really just invade Syria outright and install the Free Syrian Army either. You know, they don't really have the strength to do, to do that, and that wouldn't really resolve the Kurdish question either. So, you know, if the United States pulled out, then they would team up against the Kurds, and there would be some resolution in that sense. Uh, if the U.S. government said that it wanted to overthrow Assad, then it could work with the Turkish government and do that. But as is, we're not really doing either. We're just sort of there you know again there's just there's just no strategic direction and neither of the other two powers involved are really strong enough to forcibly resolve it so it's just dragging out interminably but yeah mostly at this point it's not about trying to win the conflict it's more trying to exploit it as it relates to peripheral issues for iran they exploit it so that they can uh, have leverage in the nuclear negotiations uh, for the Syrians, they just try to, you know, they try to get back as much territory as they can, but they're kind of a third wheel in their own conflict, given how dependent they are on foreign powers. Uh, for Turkey, they're trying to maintain as much residual influence in Syria as they can. Uh, I suspect they were originally hoping to turn it into a satellite state way back when the war started, but that hasn't happened. So they're just trying to recover whatever they can from the investment they've made thus far. Also, they're trying to mitigate the Kurdish activity in eastern Syria, because there's some overlap between militant Kurdish activity in eastern Turkey and Kurdish groups in eastern Syria. So they've focused a lot on them. In fact, I suspect Turkey is a lot more focused on the Kurdish question than they are on anything happening in western Syria at this point. Well, they're not really fans of the Kurds. No. Did you know that they're actually called Mountain Turks, Nero? Mountain Turks? <laughs> Is that the their designated name? Yep, in Turkey. Probably not the preferred nomenclature from the Kurdish perspective. Probably not. It's not even a Turkish ethnic group. It's actually Indo-European in origin. What about uh, Afghanistan? Starving to death. No foreign aid likely in the near future. No natural allies other than Pakistan, but you know, Pakistan is the kind of ally you wish on your enemies, you know? <laughs> it's not, they're not super reliable. I mean, there was some effort on the part of the Pakistani government to send some aid relief, and they did allow the Indian government to send some aid relief, surprisingly. But other than that, I don't know that there's a lot of real relief coming from Pakistan in the near future. So 
uh, it looks like there's going to be a famine and that there's going to be a severe economic recession, if not a depression, in Afghanistan. And that will probably lead to political instability at some point. But for now, the Taliban have sufficiently have a sufficiently strong grip on the country to preclude that. But yeah, there's just a lot of misery right now, hmm. owing to the economic collapse. Oh yeah, that Hmong thing ended. What was her name? There was that Huawei executive who was uh, being detained in Canada because the United States was trying to have her extradited. And she was finally released this year. Hmong Wanzhou. Hmong Wanzhou. So she had been in Canada for a couple years. And, you know, there are worse places to be under house arrest. She was in Vancouver, but uh, she was just kind of stuck there until the court proceedings could be resolved. So ultimately, that did. Uh, ultimately, the United States basically reached an agreement with her in which she would admit her guilt and admit that Huawei had, in fact, violated sanctions, specifically sanctions on Iran, which is what they were originally trying to arrest her for. And in exchange for that uh, signed confession, they agreed to let her walk. So if you're curious why that was the deal made, uh, basically it means that the United States government has very strong evidence uh, to use against Huawei, should they ever successfully bring them to court uh, for sanctions busting. You know, they weren't necessarily after her specifically. They were trying to go after Huawei. That was sort of the overarching strategic objective there. It took almost this whole episode of Agent Smith, but just saying China, that rang the bell. It was about the tennis player who oh, yeah. accused someone of sexual harassment who declared officially today or yesterday recently that she was not sexually harassed which uh, I don't know if anyone feels this way. It sounds like she may have been told to say that by someone. Probably. But, but that it's would impossible be to say. a strange turnaround because in my opinion, I think it's to the risk of the accuser in addition to the person who is accused. If you accuse someone of something like that, uh, a lot of people are going to put pressure on you because they like stability and whenever someone gets in trouble for something, nasty like that it destabilizes things pretty interesting whatever the case may be yeah most likely she's being coerced to some degree but you know it's impossible to prove mm -hmm. so it just kind of comes down to uh how different institutions want to manage that i mean if you want to assume that the allegations were accurate and that her, uh, you know, her subsequent statements are in fact coerced. If that's the assumption, the question is, what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. So I think the principal tennis association, whatever it was, was looking at uh, not holding any tennis matches in China until the issue is resolved. Although I think that kind of had to be pressured into that by uh, activists. What was her original statement? I'm going to try to find it. I was looking for it last week, too. Let's see. Oh, I can't find it. Well, anyway. Did we have any more questions? No. Okay. <clears throat> so do we have here? Not necessarily anything substantive. Have you been reading anything lately, Nero? Hmm. Not really. It's been a fairly busy week for me. A lot of people are doing fun holiday stuff. 
Our guild operations are fairly good. We did our first uh, like alt raid thing where people have their main character more or less decked out and they nerfed the content so it's easier to do now which makes it more accessible for a lot more guilds. It's an interesting question of how difficult do you make a video game? Because if you make it too easy, then the tryhards will complain. And if you make it too hard, then the casuals will complain. And if it's right in the middle, then you won't really please either group. Where would you say they're falling right now? Well, this is one of those uh, cashing in on nostalgia games because uh, it was made in what, 20, 2010, 2008 ish? It's the approximate era of that one. So the difficulty was much higher than the original World of Warcraft, but it's difficult in a different way. The original one, they had it be really tough for preparation. So you had to farm a bunch of like super strong and expensive potions and stuff. And then with this iteration, it's more mechanically difficult. So you have to be fast and effective with your class kind of a thing. I think I prefer this format better, where it's a little bit more mechanically difficult and it's not as prep-based. Sure. But yeah, one of those, it depends on who you ask kind of a thing. I'm still having a good time with it. It's funny to be recognized for that instead of the StarCraft stuff. Like, <laughs> oh dude, I, your guides help me a lot kind of a thing, which is cool. And it's it's interesting as a content creator because a lot of times you make some content and it might not really make direct money like these videos get hundreds of views to low thousands maybe for a wow video and that's obviously not going to pay rent but hearing from people that they liked it and it was useful is pretty encouraging so the people who say agent smith stuff is encouraging i would guess that's probably nice for you oh, oh that's sweet there was someone who already paid your amount plus a tip for oh. uh, today before you even got on and i was like guys like what if he does really badly i'm like that's out and they're like we love agent smith take that and i was like fine well oh, thank you very much that's very generous of you guys <laughs> let's see did i talked about uh i don't think i got into china much did i today no, just yeah. recently at the end here, which is why it made me think of the tennis player update. Okay. Well, one of the things that I was uh, thinking about was how how much progress there's been as far as uh, China competition with the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to look at some of the legislation that had been passed in that vein. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I don't think they've actually passed Usica yet, but that was one of the main bills that was drawn up. And then there was also a Xinjiang bill, which would ban, basically ban companies from using any products made with slave labor in Xinjiang. So those two bills, and then I think a couple others that I haven't organized in my notes yet, I think all of those are going to be grouped together under what's I think it's called the Eagle Act, of all things. And they're going to try to pass that, and that will basically be like an omnibus China bill, pretty much. And there's not a lot new happening, per se, in those bills. Obviously, the Xinjiang thing is pretty new. Uh, that's actually written relatively ambiguously. It's kind of going to... Technically, the impetus is on companies to prove that uh, the goods they're buying are not in any way linked to uh, slave labor in Xinjiang. And that's pretty hard to do because it's just inherently difficult to prove a negative, basically. So some some companies have been complaining about that. But I suspect the ambiguity is uh, written into the law purposely. So basically, they want to create a significant trade barrier to prevent companies from uh, significantly trading with Xinjiang, if not China in general. So that's what you would call a non-tariff barrier to trade. So that's one new thing they want to do. Another thing, which is more in Usica, is uh, they want to dump a lot of money into research and development. Uh, you know, the United States has 
has been historically pretty successful at using public-private research cooperative efforts to develop new technologies. Uh, basically, they... Uh, what's the word I want? Well, basically, they develop the tech in its embryonic stage, and that serves as a platform from which to jump into the private sector. <clears throat> so USICA is basically all about just providing a lot more funding uh, on research and develop. It's research and development specifically with regard to sensitive technologies. Uh, quantum computing, for example, is one of them. Uh, there's a couple others as well. I think 5G might be one. 5G tends to be a little overhyped though. But yeah, just key technologies that the Chinese government has identified as strategic and that they're trying to develop with their industrial policy. The United States is kind of reciprocating here with USICA and trying to invest in the, the same technologies as well as probably some other ones. I want to try to read into USICA a little more to figure out exactly how they're going to operationalize that. I think it's going to be mostly stuff like grants but that may or may not be sufficient to really significantly increase uh, research. You know, you kind of have to have people researching the topic already, you know, in order to get people to kind of take up grants, you know, there has to be something there first. <clears throat> There's probably enough there already in the United States. We have a pretty solid research and development core already, but, uh, you know, depending on how they design it, it may or may not be effective in the long run. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a difference between implementing an effective program, which is expensive and uses a lot of money, as opposed to just dumping money on a problem so that you can say that you're doing something about it. So I don't really know which of those Usica is right now. But on the plus side, it is at least an effort to address competition with China. And if you've been listening to this segment for the past couple of years, and if you have, you know, God bless you. But if you have, you've noticed that one of the themes in the first couple of years is that the U.S. wasn't really or had not really historically been doing much about China. You know, the Trump administration was pretty much the first and even they only really started to do it in like mid-2018. There's also some stuff in the newest NDAA uh, that's the bill in which basically the military gets its budget for the next year. And so they have some stuff in there as far as boosting spending to the military and some key technologies uh, relevant to competition with China. So those are kind of the three major items there. But you can kind of see how the government is taking competition more seriously and is trying to at least spend money on certain sensitive areas that are relevant to the competition, you know, new technology uh, specifically being a high point. I don't know if that's going to really be efficacious. You know, Chinese economic influence is hard to counter, legislatively speaking. You know, it's just, you know, they're the top trading partner of pretty much almost every country on the planet at this point. And uh, the kind of influence you get in other countries with that is very strong. And it's not something that you can deter with like an aircraft carrier battle group. So there's kind of a limit to how much the United States can do there. We're going to trade with China. You can't do that. We have an aircraft carrier battle group. Shit. Yeah, and it doesn't help that the United States has kind of ruled out joining the... Uh, Pacific Partnership, you know, the big free trade deal that it was negotiated under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably the single easiest thing that we could do at this point as far as countering Chinese influence, but that's kind of become politically toxic such that it's a hard sell mm -hmm. in the U.S. politically speaking. If it happens at all, it'll happen in 2023. Because after, I don't think they'll do it in like a election year, like with the midterm elections coming up. It's just a little too spicy. But 2023 is possible, depending on circumstances at the time anyway. Well, there's also been some international stuff going on. Uh, 
Australia passed, passed rather, their version of the Magnitsky Act which is basically uh, an act, well, legislation in the United States that allowed the government to apply sanctions as punishment for human rights abuses. That's kind of a short version of the legislation, but that's basically what it does. And uh, Australia passed their version of the bill, basically. And uh, the expectation is that they're going to be using it on China, most likely vis-a-vis -vis the Xinjiang issue. So that was a step forward, so to speak, for the coalition the United States is trying to form uh, to counter Chinese influence. Yeah, I'd say probably the Quad, which is an informal group of countries, is probably the strongest anti-China group at this point. I can't even call it an alliance. It's not explicitly so, but... What is the Quad? Uh, it refers to... Japan, India, Australia, and the United States. And uh, the four of them together basically just cooperate on common concerns vis-a-vis -vis China. Mm -hmm. And it's always kind of been an aspirational group more than a de facto alliance. You know, they don't necessarily cooperate as much as they could, and there's definitely no treaty obligation by which they do so. But because they have a common interest in fighting Chinese influence, they tend to cooperate in that regard. So I think in India's case, the United States has shared intelligence with them vis-a-vis uh, -vis their border with China on the Himalayas, for example. And Japan has been particularly proactive. Uh, Japan has an investment agreement with India by which they have, uh, by which they're investing in a major corridor that the Indian government is trying to develop between New Delhi and Mumbai, I think it was. <clears throat> So that's an example of Japan trying to exert some economic influence there. And then Australia, kind of there because the United States is there more, but also because uh, they want to try to mitigate economic influence. Because uh, Australia's economy is interlinked with China's economy due to its mining industry. You know, the Australians export a lot of uh, raw material to, Aus to China. And so trying to mitigate that dependency uh, is one of the things they try to accomplish by participating in things like the Quad or AUKUS uh, that was agreed to earlier this year. So stuff like that is more about uh, balancing, necessary, more so than necessarily than uh, trying to actively support, say, Japan or, Aust or India or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it centers more on India because there's always been a desire of the United States to try to ally to some degree with India, especially since the competition with China got to be a thing. But institutionally speaking, there's a lot of reluctance in India to do that because there's just a lot of suspicion of the United States. You know, India was more of a Soviet aligned country during the Cold War, although they were never formally allied with the Soviets. Officially, they were not aligned. Uh, but in the early 70s, the Indira Gandhi administration in India kind of leaned more towards the Soviets. So as a result, there's a lot of institutions within the Indian government and especially the foreign policy establishment that are just sort of institutionally biased against the United States and are generally more pro-Russian. That doesn't mean they're not willing to work with the US where it's beneficial to them, but it does mean that an outright alliance is fairly unlikely. Some of the human rights considerations probably also bother them. Hmm. Yeah, the Prime Minister of India right now is a guy named Narendra Modi. And uh, he, before he became Prime Minister, he was governor of the province of Gujarat, or actually state of Gujarat, I should say. And uh, he was controversial because during his tenure in office, there was a major massacre that happened. It was a, a sectarian massacre in which uh, I think Muslims on a train were slaughtered. I don't quite remember what the genesis of it was, but as a result of that, he ended up on a list in the United States. And uh, that was very uncomfortable because when he did become prime minister, uh, the United States was faced with the prospect of basically keeping this guy on a no-fly list, <laughs> preventing him from traveling to the United States. 
<clears throat> so ultimately, they decided that diplomacy uh, sort of was more important, and so they took him off that list. And so he's he's not officially sanctioned in that way. But uh, there's never really stopped being cons concerns about uh, Narendra Modi and his ties to far right groups in India have never really fully abated. So if there were an alliance with the United States and the Modi administration did something to violate this, that, or the other human right, that could be very awkward for both countries. <clears throat> so it's much easier to keep things informal so that uh, such issues do not really arise. You still going? Man, this match is like for the full map. They're playing a turtle strat where they just try to make <laughs> an unkillable army and then they just sit at home. So the I guess the game plan for me for the past maybe 15 minutes has just been to exhaust the map of resources. So I took some bases that are really far forward just to mine it out so the money ends up going to me instead of to the opponent. Which is a little bit silly but some people like to play this way and it's even weirder because they opened with a proxy barracks which is the most aggressive strat so they pivoted from the most aggressive cheese in the game to the most defensive turtling strat in the game <laughs> are you gonna beat them uh, i have a lot of money so it's uh possible i have a win condition which is trade inefficiently into my opponent until they run out of money, which could happen. But I don't know how much money they have, that's the question mark. Well, we did get another question here. I'm Not curious really. about your military experience and history. None, I don't have any military experience or history. The closest I could come is being related to people who do. I had a relative who was a Vietnam vet and then I have a relative right now in the Air Force, different relative in the Air Force. So I grew up with lots of stories about, you know, Vietnam and stuff. And so that kind of created an interest. But yeah, my I myself do not have substantive, well, any military experience. I haven't fought anywhere. I haven't joined any, you know, I haven't joined the reserves or anything like that. Although I did have that one cousin who joined the reserves. He actually got deployed to East Africa, <laughs> much to his chagrin. It's not really what he had in mind when he joined up. And my interest in military history is very nerdy in nature. It's not predicated on experience. It's More of an armchair general read. than a field sergeant. Yeah. See, what else did we have here? I could keep looking for that newsletter list. Yeah, if you want regular news, I think it was Dagnip who asked the question earlier. Uh, if you email him, he does a weekly sort of newsletter thing where you can just get some general news about what's been going on. Yeah, it's just a list of articles I've read in a given week. Yeah. It's nothing super sexy. It's pretty sexy. <laughs> well, there are a couple women on that list. Mostly people I met through uh, you and Michael back in the day. Because hmm. I talked to them and sometimes they would ask to be on it. So some of their email addresses are still on there. Everybody wants to be on the fancy list. It's like being on Santa's list instead of getting a Christmas present at Christmas time. You get some news articles every week. Yeah. I don't know that I don't know that any of them still read it though. Assuming they even still use those emails. I know nobody's reading the one I send to Michael's email address. 
I never had the heart quite to take him off. Dude, I did the same thing with uh, him being a friend of mine on Battle.net. It's like, oh, you're, yeah. you're not going to clear best friend out of Battle.net. I've talked with him once uh, back in the day about the digital footprints that we leave. And that's a thing that's just gradually changing. As technology gets more advanced, there's a greater share of people's lives that are just uploaded to the the web and so on so that kind of stuff never goes away so you have evidence of a person's life even after they pass on in all these little digital corners where they had fun and made themselves known yeah i still see his screen name pop up now and again i think he's still on steam or maybe he's not don't remember. I think maybe Steam is the one he disappeared from. A lot of people some... deleted their Facebook. He's the kind of person who would do that. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. For people who aren't in the loop, the gentleman who was basically our our mutual friend who got us kind of talking and the original format of our conversations wasn't in a, a podcast kind of show like this. It was just, we're just hanging out and he worked and made a good deal of money and agent smith and i we made basically no money <laughs> and kukio was he was kind of like a renaissance man who fell through a time machine and ended up being in the 21st century in that he really valued knowledge and conversation he was a conversationalist in probably the greatest sense of the word where he would like to talk to people just for the exercise of seeing what they had to say and how they said it, their approach to stuff, which was really cool. I definitely think I picked up a lot of my speechcraft ability just directly from ways that he talked. One thing that yeah. we discussed together pretty early on was ums and uhs versus pauses and just having a, a slightly slower cadence in your speech, but greater efficiency where what you were saying for every word of it and every second of it had some level of use instead of just making sounds like an um doesn't really tell a person what you're about to say it just tells them that you're about to say something i found it nice it took me long enough <laughs> Did you want this? What? A list of newsletters. Oh, sure. If you send it to me, then I can put it in the description of this video. So just send it in Discord. It's... It might be too long. Too long for description? Well, what is... In Discord, you say? Yeah, if you send it in Discord, then I can put it in oh. the YouTube video okay. description. I'm not going to put it in Twitch chat. Yeah, I think it would flood Twitch chat for sure. Gotcha. Should I just do this here with the uh, questions? Uh, sure, you could. And Moss can get a free peep at it. Let's see. Oh, is there... Oh, there's a limit to how many characters. <laughs> Split it in two. It's, it's going to have to be more than two. It's going to be like six... When people ask, hey, where do you get your news? Do you really want to know? It might be too many. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, that, that should work. Okay, so there's that. That. Squeeze these in. Yeah. There we go. And if anybody emails me, I can send it that way too. That's no big deal. Nice. <laughs> hey, what did I do with the. Uh... Oh, that's right. Forgot about the. Uh... Are we okay on time? Are you still? 
the Duking opponent. Duking it out in there? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. okay. So one of the things that uh, came up in the past year was uh, Chinese military bases. You know, there's always, there's been speculation for years that uh, China's going to try to build military bases overseas in order to project power in the rest of the world, but it's never really happened. Uh, but there were some significant moves in, in that direction this past year. So there was a, a CIA report that was leaked or released recently. And uh, there's evidence, apparently, that the Chinese government is trying uh, to gain access to a naval base in Equatorial Guinea in Africa. <clears throat> and there's already a uh, deep water commercial port in Equatorial Guinea that was built by the Chinese. So it seems that they're trying to uh, convince the Equatorial government that uh, the Chinese Navy should have access to that, allegedly, allegedly. Uh, it could be nothing because there's been, you know, scares like this before, but uh, the fact that the CIA is involved and that, you know, they've kind of taken note of it suggests that there may be something there. And there was kind of a m minor diplomatic push by the Biden administration to try to improve relations. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, there was also allegations in the past year that uh, that a Uyghur activist was detained in the United Arab Emirates and uh, was sent to a black site operated by Chinese intelligence. Now this could also be a rumor because it hasn't really been verified, but that it suggests that uh, the Chinese, if it's true, that would suggest that the Chinese government is trying to uh, not only improve relations with the Middle East such that they can do something like this, but also that they uh, want to try to use relations with the rest of the world, with other countries, to try to go after uh, dissidents of one kind or another, which they've always done to a degree. You know, they try to get other countries to extradite dissidents and whatnot, but normally they don't have them detained in another country and then send agents there to torture them. That would be new. So the most substantive development had to do with a port in Cambodia. So the Cambodian government just full on has allowed uh, the Chinese Navy to use a port there. Now it's not entirely clear that this is going to amount to like the construction of a full on naval base, but uh, the fact that the Cambodian government saw fit to allow access to the Chinese Navy indicates just how much influence the Chinese government has over Cambodia, uh, but also suggests that there is interest in the Chinese Navy being able to use the base. So this doesn't necessarily change much because the Chinese Navy already has a pretty substantive presence in the South China Sea, but it is the most credible gain that they've made in terms of projecting power overseas. So in that sense, it's significant. So three different regions here, Southeast Asia, uh, Equatorial Africa, and the Middle East, in which there have been alleged gains that China has made strategically in terms of its ability to project power. They've also signed some trade deals with Venezuela, but Venezuela is so dysfunctional that those investments are basically just worthless. China has actually lost money on Venezuela over the past 10 years trying to bail them out, and at this point they're kind of done trying. There really hasn't been any substantive new Chinese investment in Venezuela for years, at least none that I'm aware of. Yeah, that's all stuff to watch. I still don't think the Chinese government is all that interested in projecting power overseas. It's just really expensive. It would be diplomatically complicated since the United States would invariably overreact in response. So it makes more sense to focus uh, political capital on domestic issues. And there's no shortage of those. We talked about those last week. There's just not a lot of benefit in the cost benefit there. Yeah, that's the tricky thing with uh, the power of governments and countries nowadays is you can 
You can make plays, but they can't be too aggressive. Otherwise, people make aggressive plays back at you. Yeah. So it's a lot of posturing and partially committal stuff. I may be about to learn that the hard way in Shadow Empires. <laughs> I'm trying to go to war with another country, but there's just so much stuff you have to do in preparation. It's taken me like 20 turns just to get ready. We'll see how it goes. I think I can win, but I've never actually done it before since it's my first playthrough, so we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. First playthrough is generally more about learning, and there's a lot to learn in a war game like Shadow and Byers. True. Is it the kind of military control of like a Civ game? Yeah, it's turn-based, mm -hmm. and the map is Hex, uh, but it's really more like a hardcore war game. You know, mm -hmm. it's a Matrix game, so it's it's almost more like a board game in that sense. But it has a lot of depth to it. You know, the the reviews that I've read of it generally describe it as being like a mix uh, between a hardcore tabletop war game and uh, a Civ style 4X builder. So like with Civ, there's a lot of focus on designing the economy of the game, designing diplomacy, uh, just giving you lots of things to do as far as uh, building up your civilization. But combat is generally a little wonky. You know, it's, you know especially since Civ 4, they've kind of gone with a tic-tac-toe style of combat where one type of unit kind of offsets another and you kind of have to balance them and that's pretty much the extent of the uh, complexity to combat, you know, without going into things like, you know, terrain and whatnot. Uh, but in a tabletop war game, generally you have a lot more to work with in terms of combat, you know, in terms of bonuses, logistics, terrain, etc. So that's kind of what they did with Shadow Empires. It's just a lot of really good detailed combat mechanics combined with a lot of detail to economic and logistical man mechanics. You can tell how much effort they put into those by how ugly the game is because they put virtually no resources into making it look pretty. Basically, all of the budget just went into the underlying mechanics. It's called Shadow what? Shadow Empires. Or Shadow Empire. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, Shadow oh, Empire. Oh. Can it screenshots of it now? Yeah, very simple, just polygon shapes that you're moving around but I would guess oh, yeah. the the complexity of the situation is going to be really high yeah so that would it, make it really satisfying if you make some good plays yeah but you got to make the plays and it takes forever to get through a turn especially when you're when you try to when you're learning the game you, know, you kind of have to take your time with everything mm -hmm. and like I said it's taken me like 20 turns just to kind of build up the military, get them located in the right places, and also build up the logistical chain. You know, if, you're, uh, if your logistics are not strong enough to support a large army, then it's pretty much pointless. You're not going anywhere. So I also had to put a lot of effort into building up logistical infrastructure and roads and whatnot uh, on the border of the country that I'm trying to invade. I mean, I've been doing this for like a week. <laughs> I've just been preparing for this one war for like a week and i've just been asymptotically approaching declaration of war what you just described is the strategy that i use to defeat this opponent there's really? cre yes there's creep spread this is my logistical network for the zerg which allows me to move fast and to see what's around because i control the roadways basically and if you look at the mini map here i have about 60 percent of the map is under my logistical network. So they ended up being forced into one final engagement where I ended up having more value because I controlled more of the resources over time. Yeah, the chat wants a small recap. This was a 45 minute match, which is very long for a StarCraft game. Average duration is 15. And they were hyper aggressive against me early on and then they were hyper defensive after that. So my objective was just to basically think about 
half of the map and just to eat 10% more than that and convert that into army. I didn't trade efficiently into them. My units lost is, yeah, pretty bad compared to theirs. But Terran is meant to be more efficient. So we, we did the locust approach kind of a thing where we just had more and more stuff that we kept throwing at them by virtue of having more resources. They didn't have any ducks, huh? They didn't have enough ducks. They did make some ducks. That makes me think of the Liberator, which they made a bunch of. They did make ducks, but our locusts were too numerous. They should have called in a few extra planes of ducks. Well, congratulations on your hard-won victory. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. We'll probably, I think it would be fair to do a week off next week, just because we've got Christmas holidays, so you can spend more time with your family. But I appreciate you very, very much for coming on. Uh, Moss Neotech, thank you for handling questions. Chat, appreciate you being very pleasant. And Agent Smith, thanks for hammering out a big three hour. I know that. I think you were like ready to wrap up, and it's like your game is still going. Yeah, it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I need to finish some of these projects that I have so that I can have more depth to get into here. But yeah, that's I kind of expended all of the sort of easy stuff. Nice. So we got a bunch of the notes out of the way this time. Well, if you yeah. have any questions or corrections from the YouTube comments, feel free to add those. I'll try to get this uploaded very soon. And we will see you on the next episode of World Discussion with Agent Smith. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. See you next time. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas. <laughs>